an expert on how experts aren't experts. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The choice are going to manage to get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Grant? That's right. And Bald Brian. I'm the world's number one dickhead. <laughs> Vinny Tortorich, the world's number two dickhead, has joined us in studio. The film Beyond Impossible is available now to rent or buy on Amazon. Uh, lots to talk to Vinny about. Um, first, uh, to answer the question from yesterday, which is uh, somebody tweeted me the answer, and it all made sense. Uh, piss bottles. I've been finding random piss bottles. Right. Uh, not everywhere, but enough it, to notice. It went from zero to what the fuck is going on, right. and uh, you know, homeless. Mm. Nah, they just piss on a tree, right. and right. then truckers. Nah, the the long hauler guys. You know, the eighteen wheeler guys. They got it worked out. Right. Soccer moms. Nah, no, wh- wh- where's this coming from? Uh, delivery drivers. There's there's. 7,000 more percent delivery drivers, all the Grubhub guys oh. and all the guys driving all the food everywhere and the Amazon guys. Right. They're all driving. They don't have the sleeper cab in their truck. Oh, if only. They're all, yeah, <laughs> they're all driving, every, they're driving our shit everywhere. I mean, remember like when you'd go out when you were young if you saw a delivery truck in front oh. of someone's house, it was like a, a oh. deal. Something yeah. was going on. The Wells Fargo yeah. wagon. Someone's yeah. moving. <laughs> yeah. Or we, yeah. Won, won what's, game show. what's going on? Yeah, right. Now, delivery mm. everywhere, Every all the time. We don't really talk about it. Like, did we just put 700% more roads a vehicle on the roads with everyone just having their yep. food brought to yep. them and everything on Amazon? Well, these guys are out. They're on the clock. They're making deliveries. Uh Try to use a bathroom at a gas station in L.A. County. No. And, uh, no, but this, no. You know, <laughs> pump number seven, $7,000. You know, like, you can't go, it's, it doesn't, it's always inoperable. Yep. It's out of work. It, it's not inoperable. They don't want For you. For employees only. Yeah. And then all the fucking homeless people wanting to go in there and shoot up and piss on the wall and everything. So where are you going to take a piss yeah. if you're out on a route? And you're gone all day, and, and you're delivering bottle. shit all day. I actually have some knowledge about that because uh, I spent a lot of years on a bicycle, fifteen to seventeen thousand miles a year. Wow! When I was doing all those ultra events, so, that's more mm-hmm. than I put on my car. That yeah, elite. that's more than the average person puts on a car. And you're basically looking well, down. Well, the bike in was front on the roof of, of the car in a rack, oh, so yeah. it's not but a hero. But, but, it, but it did travel yeah. that far. It did. Um, <laughs> But you're looking down and in front of you, and you would be shocked when you spend that kind of time on the road, the number of piss bottles you see everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, that and the number of tools I've picked up. Oh, um, really? Or, yeah, oh, I, I, I have a tool chest full of tools. Can we just— Road, road tools? Yeah, uh, crescent wrenches seem to be the, the most common. I guess people drop them in the, the well of their car mm-hmm. when they're working and they can't find it and it shakes loose on the road and oh, wow. there it is. Can we make a rule which is, uh, I don't mind you pissing in a bottle if you're a hardworking delivery man, mm-hmm. but um, you can't toss it out the fucking window of the van. It's gross. It's a bottle of fucking piss. Yeah. I, I don't want to know how much vitamin B you're getting. I don't want to know <laughs> if you ate asparagus the mm, night before. And also, it's going to start affecting the shape of bottles. You know, Gatorade's oh, got the sure. big mouth one, yeah. Yeah. which I don't Stop. need, but I hear, right. you know, Pete Davidson might uh, make short work of. <laughs> I'm just saying. You're an old school Coke bottle kind of guy. You, you got a bottle of piss in your rig. Shoot, please. Fucking throw it, throw it in a trash can. I Let it totally roll around concur. the van yes. until uh, until you break for lunch. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. I think I, I would think proper etiquette is piss in the bottle. That's your business. Uh, let it roll around in the in the van or stuff it under the seat or whatever it is. When you break, like when you go to lunch or something, open said piss bottle, sprinkle out over some sort of planter or something in the woods, in the ivy mm-hmm. somewhere, mm-hmm. then put the lid back on, then throw it away. Yep. That's, fair. that's, that's, that's fair, fair. protocol. Right? Yeah, that is yeah. protocol. We can agree on this. Yes. We do not have a lot of people following protocol, and that's where no. the piss bottle That's comes from. where we need the light-up signs on the highway to start telling people to do this. <laughs> Empty your piss bottle. Empty your piss bottle. (laughs) How much how much out of home and out of bathroom pissing and shitting have we had in this country in the last year? 
I well, look. You're talking about a backyard buddy. It's 100. <laughs> percent Yeah, it, it was a novelty when I was growing right. up. Now it's now it's a thing. Yeah. Um, Vinny, I know you're you're working on a kayak. I'm very interested in this. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, uh, every year. New Year's resolutions come around, and, and, and everyone goes, oh, I'm going to give up this. I'm going to give up that. I, I, everybody's giving up. Mm-hmm. And I, I never give up anything. I always see what I can add. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, one of the, I, I did several revolu- uh, resolutions this year. One was at least 365 hours of aerobics. You know, an hour a day, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, I'm traveling right now. So, mm-hmm. you know, so, so last week of the year is going to be hell. Yeah, <laughs> you like, push look at my watch. Back and go, oh, boy. It. But so, you know, that's uh, I'm, I'm ahead of the game on that, and I can stay. And you know, I do different things like on my rowing machine. I'm, I, I got to do two million meters rowing. Well, that also plays in with the aerobics, right? I'm, I'm getting two for one there. But then I started thinking. I'm always. We always talk about crap we want to do and we never get to Mm -hmm. and i looked around and went i'm going to be 60 this year and i've always talked about building a boat from scratch i mean i'm talking from scratch not buying a kit or anything else Mm -hmm. i went out and picked out the lumber myself Mm. you know i got some some um yellow cedar oh it's cedar yeah Yeah, yellow cedar and red you know cedar Mm-hmm. And uh, there it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went to one of the best, it turns out about 90 minutes from where I live, there's this guy, he's one of the best boat builders in the United States, um, Joey Schott. And I said, Joey, um, I would like to come in. What would it cost? And all that? Because to build a boat like this by someone like Joey, it can be upwards of twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, Nick. I asked Nick Offerman. Oh, if a, if Nick Offerman's doing, it, it's probably forty. And I'm right. not. I'm not just saying that these boats can go forty thousand dollars. And my question was, why? Why? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, it takes a lot of time. Mm-hmm. This is not a fast process. You're looking at right there. You're looking at seventy hours worth of work. Mm, yeah. And because, you know, we have to take those planks, we have to rip them. And after you rip them, you have to plane them. Everything has to be, to start out, we have to build the rib to build it on. Yeah, you got to cut the ribs out. Everything has to be done from scratch wow. because I wanted to learn the whole whole process. And even, you see how when you come around the edge, is, right? Is it, is, it a, is it a butt joint with the strips? Is it shiplap, aptly named? Is it um, TNG? Well, no, it's not. It's not tongue, uh, tongue and groove. Basically, it's one laying on top of the other. But since they're always curving around, mm-hmm. you have to backplane them. So you yeah. have to get a bevel on the back. That's and called then, uh, that's shiplap. Okay, it's uh, basically when you do siding on your house. That's a shiplap seam, and I'm right. guessing that's how they built ships. This is amazing. <laughs> well, no, it, it really is very. I know this is bad podcast, but you have to get that bevel just right, and you're sitting there beveling. Like your life depends on it. And then when you come around the top, you have to get a chamfer on the back because it's got to meld in with the rest of it. But there's something. This is absolutely (laughs) spectacular. I was telling, I was yelling this at Dr. Drew the other day to um, to, uh, dovetail, pardon the pun, because there's a joint. Dovetail joint. uh, To your thoughts, which is, um, I remember... You guys remember the mid or later 90s when there was this big push? You'd see all these commercials with Sting and Sheryl Crow, and they're talking about music in schools. Oh, yeah. You know, right. Right. Kids music who, cares. Kids yeah. who right. studied the trombone, do 46% yeah. better on their math. And I would watch all those commercials and go, uh, what about shop class? What the fuck happened to shop right. class? Like, okay. Everyone played an instrument in school for a semester, and then they put it down. Then it was like, fuck it. I used my dad's mouthpiece for his flugelhorn to try to smoke weed through once. Um, (laughs) That's about my relationship with the flugelhorn. But shop class, like using your hands, learning how to work a bandsaw, like really tactile. And I've been circling back to this thing. The, the entire pandemic, which is all the guys I know who work with their hands are utterly sane as it pertains to, mm-hmm. let's say, COVID. And the ones that are in cubicles staring at their oh, phone, right. tweeting up with the screen, <laughs> watching the evening news, they're all fucking batshit crazy. And I thought there's got to be some correlation between getting out, working mm-hmm. with your hands, you know, tilling some soil and this. But for kids, mm-hmm. a nice and, – and also the thing about – the shop in putting the putting the canoe together, whatever it is your project, it 
it really gets you grounded in reality because right. the shit either works or it doesn't. You don't have it'll sink. You're the your, drown or you're yeah, yeah, you don't have your imaginary fucking. Here's how I wish life was. Right. We're going off a fucking cliff right now as a society because we have too many fucking dingbats who, with their idea of how everything should work. You know, the yeah. whole truck fleet should be electric, and then kids should have world class. <laughs> you know, all these proclamations. No one's been in the shop when you go in the fucking shop. You can't make the proclamations. Yeah. You have to fucking get to work. It has to work or, or it won't work. Yeah. You have to put a plan together. We're losing that because the kids aren't going into the shop. No one's going into the garage. Everyone's going in the cubicle. And now we have a lot of those people graduating, and now they're setting policies. Yeah. And they're the pie in the sky, folks. They're not the, the uh, shop kids. Well, to be fair, this kayak is Vinny's truth. So we don't actually know if it's going to work mm-hmm. or not. Yeah, it, we don't know if it floats. He's it still reimagining a, kayaking. It still has a hell of a hole in the I'm bottom sure parts of it. Will float. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it Titanic? But you know, speaking of shop, you know, my dad was a history teacher in a public high school. He spent more time in the shop, and he would bring me and my older brother into the shop. We built before I was like ten. We had built two go karts in that oh, shop. Man. You know, my dad was showing us how to weld and everything. <laughs> By the time I was 11 and Michael was 12, we were Irish twins, um, we built our first combustible engine, a, a six-cylinder Chevy engine. Wow. And, you know, but you know, until a dad says, hey, we're building an engine from scratch, and then he takes you to a junkyard and says, we're building this on used parts, partially because we didn't have a lot of money. There were school teachers, but also... You had to source everything from the junkyard, except for things like points, condensers, and, and plugs at the well, end. Well, it, it gives you the, – the thing is, is when you live in the mechanical world, you cannot live in the highfalutin Fantasy. notions and imagined yeah. world. And the more people that have never rolled up their sleeves and lived in that mechanical world, the more – retarded ideas we're going to have floated and eventually right. will become policy and it won't work. So – I just would like people to get, I'd like schools to get the fucking shop fired up again. Maybe Offerman could be the spokesperson (laughs) for it. And uh, and get people, it also makes you sane because you're Mm -hmm. occupied and you're engaged versus, you know, arguing with someone online. But yes. Trade, is having a trade a rich man, poor man? Because most be. of us don't do it, but it's like, oh, Vinny goes to someone who builds $25,000 kayaks. Mm. He's probably not rich, though. No, I'm not rich. Not you, the guy. <laughs> no, the guy, the kayak guy. Offerman's rich, but he makes his bones somewhere <laughs> but else. But that's what I mean. Like, the re- this wide swath of us don't really know how to do much. It'd be, it'd be nice if they made it part of the curriculum, kind of brought it back. I've not... You know, when I was growing up, it was metal shop, wood shop, yeah. electronics, plastic shop, whatever. Was there an I, auto shop in a lot of stuff? Auto oh, yeah. shop yeah. later on. I've not heard word one <clears throat> from my son about anything. He's got the diversity coach showing up in bloviating, but there is no shop to, to discuss. You know what two classes my six-year-old stepson is in is feelings class and digital citizenship. Oh, wow. Wow. He is so yeah. fucked. Mm. <laughs> So feelings, yeah, feelings, class. feelings class and digital citizenship. Feelings. Um, Welcome to feelings class, bitch. <laughs> How feel, do you feel? I feel like the ship join is good enough. <laughs> if it ain't good enough, I'm sinking. Ship lap, but who's counting? <laughs> Not me. The uh, I didn't the, even know what it was called before I walked in here. I had uh, now, now this is fun. <laughs> back to your field of expertise. Um, I, Chris, coincidentally brought up some uh, Trader Joe's cauliflower bread. Yeah. I had a cauliflower pizza the other day that was incredibly enjoyable, so I thought, this can't be right. Yep. And uh, Vinny's never going <laughs> to abide by this. But I, I read the ingredients, and it wasn't bad. Is there uh, In cauliflower pizza, you get the thin crust. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's not that big a, a drop from regular pizza to cauliflower, but... That makes me suspicious. Is there a cauliflower pizza out there that we could order? Chris just showed me something in the back, and I can sign off on that. I can sign off on that product because it's only cauliflower, 60%, and it's whole egg is the number two ingredient. Um, and Oh, here it is. And then there's grated Parmigiana, and then you have uh, some deactivated yeast. It's the kind you make from scratch. So if you make it from scratch, you do the shredded cauliflower, egg, cheese, and just some seasoning. Right, so I could sign off on that. And that has to be refrigerated. 
Mm. Oh, is that he, a good sign? Yeah, when yeah, of course. I, I said to, when he was reading, I said, "Chris, this has got to be frozen, right?" He goes, "No, refrigerated." He goes, "How mm. did you know?" It's because there's real food in that. You can, right. You know, whenever you just get something off the shelf and it's not refrigerated, it's going to have either cassava flour or um, arrowroot flour or some other crap, and you might as well just be eating pizza at that point. Yeah. Right. Um, I keep you thinking. Of, I keep thinking of you because. Uh, you keep hearing these news reports like Ukraine, it's the breadbasket of Europe. We get 30% of our wheat out of the Ukraine. I thought Vinny's laughing all the way to the kayak with yep. this shit. I know. I uh, I had a retarded conversation with my mom where she was explaining to me. You just conversation. Our conversation. My mom was explaining to me how meat was bad because it wasn't like she, you need to eat natural things like natural bread natural grains animals are pretty natural natural uh granola she likes the natural stuff mm-hmm. but uh meat not not so good and then uh she was explaining that the mediterranean diet is the way to go which i'm curious to hear you guys speak about but that still i also holds strong after many years here's a um here's an observation i was watching the news last night and they did one of those i always hate these pieces where they go to the gas station mm-hmm. And they talk to people that are pissed off. <laughs> sure. Gas they, price is high. Uh, I don't like it. No, sure. It needs, to be, tank there. needs to be smaller. <laughs> hey, I used to, five should be three at, at most. Yeah, I used to fill up for $41. Now it's 102 Yeah, yeah, we, yeah no, the, no, it's it going up. We do I, I, I could do without the how hot is it outside yeah. ones where you go talk to the guys doing the paving. Yeah. He's doing out there. What's it like? Oh, man. Oh, it's, hot. it's hot. Yeah, these guys. Every person, so they just talk to like five random mm-hmm. people who are pulling up in their car, all fat. Mm. And these were just randos. You, you, don't you say. know what I mean? Like, you yeah, don't you say. don't say. But it was random. You know, they didn't go to a, you know, the Jenny Craig and interview folks <laughs> yeah. uh, smoking out front. They just went to a random gas station. And they weren't talking about anything but gas. But I started noticing everybody is fat, like randomly fat. Yeah. We're collectively up. The 76. Adam, I, I'm right now. The reason I'm in town is because there's Expo West. It's the biggest natural, listen to these words, natural food convention in the country. It's down in Anaheim. Mm-hmm. And I showed up yesterday to set up my booth because we're selling my ultra fat. You know, we're getting into bigger places and everything. So I have a big booth at the convention. I think I'm the only natural food there. Mm. Everything is is fake. Uh, I sent Chris a thing. Everything is is uh, fake. So this was on a hippie van out front. Plant chicken. Plant chicken. Mm-hmm. Natural. This is natural. Plant chicken is natural. There's nothing natural in this place. The two booths on both sides of me. One is they're calling it keto. Something is all grains. Mm-hmm. So you know you can put keto on anything now and just mm-hmm. call it grain. On the other side, they're talking about you know plant based. Everything is plant based, which I'm not even sure what that means anymore. Nothing is natural that I can see so far. Remember, when Taco Bell got away with serving not beef by calling it beefy. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because that gets around right. actually being beef. I see a lot of keto friendly now, which I assume means nothing because it could be keto friendly. I don't. I don't assume that means anything. Uh, Brian, you can actually put keto certified on some. Uh, th- th- who's no certified? Right. Board. Uh, which part yeah. of the board? What, what, what part of, of the government is certifying keto? It's it's all bullshit. Complete bullshit. Right. And I get enough of it. I, I hate to get upset every time I walk in here, but you guys make me upset. But <laughs> That's Gina. I, I mean, I'm walking around this convention, uh-huh. and this is all I see. I can't find one natural food at a natural foods convention. Well, it, are it's we going to, you know. And people are fat. Are the, we going to have to start working on some of these labels? Like, is the government going to have to get involved? You no, know, but the government is involved. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. They're in cahoots. And I know this makes me sound like a flat earther, but... When, you know, we trade grains worldwide, we all grains, right? It's, it's what it's we do. It's a commodity. Did. It's a commodity. We started doing it during the Second World War. We figured, I saw oh, trading places. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what's going on. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're not going to hurt the people who are paying for them to be politicians. Mm-hmm. These are our policymakers who are taking money from these people. So nothing is going to change. It's not going to change until uh, it, we... And we're so broken now. You just said five people. You couldn't find the thin guy. No, couldn't I, find cu- thin guy. I, I couldn't find a husky guy. They're all you know. Fat. You don't hear the vice president, anyone speaking about, hey, we have a real problem in this country. Everyone's fat. Mm-hmm. We're breaking under the weight of our own weight. 
We won't have a military anymore at some point. Who's going to go and fight? Everyone's waddling around. We have 1,000-pound people. They, uh, I know we saw one in yesterday's mm-hmm. show. I, it, it dry, it always drives me nuts when we talk about all the symptoms of a problem. And by the way, I've talked to a doctor, uh, and he was telling me about all these, uh, diabetic insulin centers or whatever, whatever it's called. And I'd like, can't keep up with demand. You know, it, it it seems like the opposite of government when we're talking about, you know, our healthcare system is broken and uh, we have obesity and we have childhood obesity and we have food insecurity. It's like we talk about all this stuff, but we never talk about what the root is. Like, why, mm. why are so many people having to go to these centers and be put on dialysis uh, every day? Like, wh- what is going on what? and when shall we address it? As a as a society, I don't I don't get well, it. They, they, I blame. Uh, by the way, the fucking fat shamers. Uh, they're right up there with the homeless advocates. Fuck right off. You're fucking these people up. You talk to Michael Strahan. Michael Strahan goes, "I was a fat kid. People made fun of me." I said, "Fuck it. Stopped eating the pop tarts and hit the weight room. A little shame is good." No, look, I, I don't I don't agree with the shame part, but I don't Please. agree with 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 you know, making it cool. You know, we have Lizzo out there who's taking it all off going, look how beautiful. No, Lizzo, you're not beautiful. You have type two diabetes. You have fatty liver disease. You are fucking dying. And you're telling the world that this is okay. I ain't buying in. Well, I've said it many times, a little more thin Lizzie, a little less fat Lizzo. That's me kicking it old school with Dawson. That's That's why. why, He's He's got a whole warehouse. Going to be a jailbreak in a refrigerator. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, you, good-looking female. (laughs) I like that the guy's running from the law, but he has a boner. (laughs) So, um, is there is there a cauliflower pizza I can buy versus buying the bread? Well, I'm looking at the dough. Yeah, I'm not looking at the pizza. Oh, you don't want to make it. I assume that's like a Bobley situation. That Let is me make correct. life. I, I told Chris in the back. I said he was asking. He's trying to stay thin for his wedding and mm-hmm. whole thing coming up. I said, look, do yourself a favor. Go out to any butcher, get yourself some loose sausage meat. Get mm-hmm. uh, get your favorite sausage. I would get Italian sausage. Mm-hmm. Pat it down, spread it out, shape it like a pizza if you want to. Do what you want, and then put all your pizza topping on that. Shove it in the oven. You're welcome. Make the make You're the welcome. base out the of the sausage. sausage. Make the base out of it. You will never eat pizza like another this. way ever. Yeah, ever. I'm it, with it's over you. with. You, you know, why mess around with all this stuff? All right. I, uh, it's cha- that easy. Changing gears. Um, Gina was uh, talk. We saw the SNL bit. Can't say gay. There's a can't say gay bill out of Florida. Um, I saw also, and it was getting back to classic rock. There were some uh, lady, I don't know, politicians, and they were they were They're just skip- called politicians these days. <laughs> lady politicians. They were skipping down the hall, and they were singing a song. I haven't seen this, and I don't know if they did it on purpose or inadvertently, but uh, I think you'll hear some smoke on the water oh. coming out of these ladies. So let me explain. I, 100% that yes. smoke of the water. I haven't but seen that But did they clip know yet. it? Yes, I'll tell you why. Because that was the very, as people were clapping at the end of the Kate McKinnon sketch, mm-hmm. that's what she was doing. Oh, she, she said, did smoke on the water? If you can't say it, sing it. And that's what oh, she, she did. That gay, was gay, as people gay, were applauding her gay, off. Gay, yeah. gay, gay, yeah. gay, 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 gay. Sucking cock in a mobile. <laughs> 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 we all went down to Montrose. Was it Montrose? Um, uh, yes, Frank it Zappa Montrose. and the Mothers <laughs> yeah. had the best cock in town. <laughs> <laughs> Some stupid with a big cock burnt the place to the ground. Gay, 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 gay. Homo on the water. <laughs> Yeah. Pussy in the sky. <laughs> Come on, Rich Banks. Jump on this shit. <laughs> Oof. Uh. All right. The uh, the the uh, Mediterranean diet. Now, yeah. it's, is it, what can we argue about when somebody, and also when people go, the Mediterranean diet's the best, you also have to factor in, they don't do the Golden Corral size portions, uh. and they do a lot of 
cycling yeah. or, or something. But the what is the Mediterranean diet is is all fake. It is. It, it's all made up. I needed Go, you to yell at I've my mom. I've spent a lot of time on the Mediterranean. They ain't eating that way. Mm. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go all the way back to Ansel Keys. See, mm -hmm. when everyone wants to argue with me, I got the facts here. Ansel Keys came up with a 21-country study, but he didn't call it that because he couldn't get 21 countries to agree with his epidemiological study, so it became the seven-country study. Mm -hmm. But he didn't even have seven countries. He had six. Mm. And having less than one-third, that wasn't good. So he said, you know what? We're going to go back to uh, Crete. What year is this? Uh, I don't know. 60s somewhere. Mm -hmm. We're going to go back to Crete. And we're going to, we're going to look around. Keep going. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> seven Nation, seven Nation Army. Army. <laughs> seven Nation I love this song. <laughs> we could do this one together. Gay, too. gay, 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 gay. Gay, 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 gay. Going to give a reach around. <laughs> Gonna man of glory, ho, get you around. Yeah, we gotta think of more songs, Dawson. <laughs> All right. I've Sorry. never seen Dawson having so much fun in the booth. Well, now he's gonna be occupied with coming up with some more uh, rock songs that are gay. We could turn them all gay. Or. Um, we could uh, just play um, One Night in Bangkok. Oh, sure. And not even change and the lyrics. Just be lyrics. quiet. Just be yeah. quiet. Yeah. That would be the gayest song ever. Yes. <laughs> So we got six nations. So we have six, and he, that wasn't good enough. So he went back to Greece, and uh, he went during Lent. Mm -hmm. and, you give up you meat. Know, yeah, these Christians don't eat meat during Lent. Mm -hmm. And he went, aha, there it is. Look at that. They're not eating meat. Look how healthy. No, these people eat meat around the clock if it's not these 40 days of the year. Well, mm -hmm. well, you see, you can mm -hmm. always squint your eyes enough to make anything look the way you want it to look. Mm -hmm. And then you got people like Dean Arnish coming out of the woodworks, and he's good friends with um, uh, uh, you know, Clinton. And he, you know, they start talking about this, you know, hey, you got to be vegan. You got to do this. You got to do all this stuff in the early 80s, right? And he started, you know, Mediterranean. Look how healthy they are, man. They eat meat, and the Italians eat meat. The Greeks eat meat. Everybody around the Mediterranean eats meat. Yet they call it the Mediterranean study. Go eat vegetables. <laughs> Makes no sense. Yeah, Mediterranean diet, I think, is mostly fish, olive oil, and vegetables, right? Because that's what yeah. they're eating during Lent. And yeah. when I, I lived in Greece for three months in college, that's when I was a vegetarian, you know, subsisting on pasta and bread and, and not understanding why mm -hmm. I was bloated. And they, you had a host family. They served so much meat, I had to say in Greek, I was allergic to meat. There was no, they couldn't wrap their head around why would you choose not to eat it? I mean, so I'm saying like from a personal perspective, you're right about that. Meat around the clock. I spent a lot of time in Europe. It's nothing but meat. Yet we have all this, the Europeans are better than us. They're, it's like, no, they're not. They're, they're eating meat. Sorry. Yeah, well, when my mom said it, I knew she was wrong because she said there it. were, yeah, words leaving her mouth. But I still <laughs> stuck in my head when uh, I said eat some eat some steak, and she was like Mediterranean diet. But that's you know she'll take that shit to the grave. Um, it's funny, she's still pushing granola mm. on really. Me. Yeah, it's it's always that it's my sort of carob versus uh, Hershey's Chocolate bar. Shit. It's like it's the same shit. It's yeah. just a bunch of sugar. It hits your liver the same way. Brown sugar, honey's good. White sugar. It's it's all. Uh, then uh, at some point. You get halva mixed in Ugh. into the mix. It's Gritty a, dessert. Sand. It's sand with honey in it. But anyway. Um, all right. Well, we found, it was actually tweeted to me, but Chris found my Love Hurts Norelco. Oh. It was a Norelco. I thought it was, it was shaver, shave cream. Close enough. I, it's a razor. Yeah. It's a yeah. Uh, but I knew it was out there. Mm -hmm. And it's another use of the Nazareth song. Ooh, maybe we could get gay hurts. <laughs> or loves gay. Loves gay. Sorry. Loves gay. <laughs> Love is pretty gay. By the way, I've been on this planet 57 years. I've never been shaving and had a hot looking chick come up behind me and start to rub my cheek. I'd flinch, by the way, like my hand would fly out and smack her in the face. What the fuck's going on? Shave off her eyebrow. <laughs> I've never been with a woman that just couldn't wait till I was done shaving before she came in and admired me. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> but they can't, man. Oh, yeah. we can't keep our hands Gina, off. You know. I Trust me, I know. You don't let him get to even that part of his neck no. before you've come sliding Tearing in there. Off. Yes. Wearing one of his oversized Van <laughs> Heusen shirts. Or sometimes I'm just in the doorway so he sees me in the mirror so I can go, hi, stranger. In the shirt, yes, in the Van Yes, but he Heusen. sees me in the mirror as he's shaving. In the back. We exact. got the brick facade. Yes. We got the Harley. Yes. We got the heavy My bag. My hair's in a messy lo- bun. You're in a loft. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. loft. Yeah. yeah, exactly. They never explain, how did the hog get up to the loft? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that seems like a bitch. You want to go riding? Well, I would like to ride, but uh, it takes four guys for me to get this shit out of the apartment. We're on the third floor. But uh, they got the hog. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. that's where all the real sex went on. That's right. So uh, there you are, Good. some uh, Nazareth. All right, let's see. Um, let me hit a spot, and we'll do some news. Joe Coy's going to come in sooner than later. Simply Safe, U.S. News and PC Magazine. And Popular Science, all ranked Simply Safe Home Security, the best home security of 2021. And U.S. News just named Simply Safe, the best home security of 2022. Easy to set up, do it in about 30 minutes, peel and stick. Batteries last up to 10 years. And the cameras, you just charge them up so you don't have to run cords to them or hot, make them hot, wire them, leave the electrician. Protect your uh, doors, your windows 24-7. Backed by the best professional monitoring in the business, ready to dispatch police, firefighters, or EMTs, less than a buck a day. Set it up quickly. No long-term contracts. Try it for 60 days risk-free. Customize your home's perfect system in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash Adam. Go there today. Get a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring at simplysafe.com slash Adam. All right. We'll take a break. We'll do the news right after this. News with Greg. News with Gino Grad. Break. Viral, weird crime, protest, politics. Give me news with Gina Grad. Stuff they saw on TMZ. Joe Biden, Kamala. Meet news with Gina, Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. We have more in- information on this new speech law out of Russia. So the words war and invasion are two words that can land you in prison for up to 15 years under the new Russian law. Those words are now considered fake news in the eyes of Putin, who has passed a law criminalizing the intentional spread of what he calls misinformation. That's basically what goes against the government's narrative of involving the Ukraine. The bill was passed through both the both houses of Russian parliament. It's made uh, Russia and foreign uh, reporters scramble to protect their reporters. CNN pulled out, BBC pulled out. I think they might be back now. Um, but the law doesn't stop with just regular old news outlets. TikTok suspended live streaming and new content from Russia saying the new law left the social media giant no choice. Yeah, Vinny will be glad uh, McDonald's shut down. McDonald's, nice. Starbucks, Coca-Cola, I think, mm-hmm. is stopping production there too. Well, that's all good. But, you know, when are we going to go in and stop all this? Can't, can't we all get together? Zelensky would very much like an answer I'm, to that question. Come on, gay, gay, gay. Smile <laughs> on your brother. Everybody suck a chode. Try and to come love on one another right, right now. now. I don't know. I, 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 I say every 10 minutes, it's 2022. What, what is going on? And I've also said for a long time, we just need a, a sane, a nation of sane. And a nation of people that are still into you know, human trafficking I mean, and whatever bad. else. To, ad- to address Vinny's question, it is complicated because I feel like something should be done, right? Something should right. be done to solve this. And on the other hand, it feels like prevailing sentiment is we're not the world's police. We don't want to get American soldiers involved, get risk American lives. I understand that. But at the same time, wrongs are being done in the world. I Where do you... Where do you, there, I don't think there's a right answer. It's where well, your philosophy lies. In the headline today, which I wasn't going to do a whole story on because it's just awful and there's not much to say about it, they bombed a children's hospital. So everybody in the children's hospital, all the babies and all the workers died. So it's like, yeah, Zelensky's like, I'm just going to start going to Russian separatists if you guys aren't going to help me. Fuck you guys if you're not going to close the airspace. I mean, obviously the problem is they have nukes. He's nuts. We think if we get involved, there's going to be World War III, and that slowed everyone's role. But he's heading to that anyway. He still has the nukes. uh, Look, the bottom line is you have a crazy man. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's going into another country. He's murdering people. 
And we're all sitting around in the Western world going, well, okay, we're going to take a look-see. Didn't we do that with, with, uh, with Hitler? And look what we ended up with him. Yeah, but what if Hitler had nukes? I mean, we'd have to think about it. Mm. You know, I mean, obviously it was all conventional shit back then. Right. We ended up with a nuke at the, at the end. But if Hitler had nukes, to use your example, we'd all have to have a pretty long discussion on how much intervention we wanted to yeah. do yeah. when he's nuts and he has nukes. There's you know? always the answer. It's, it's, it's a philosophical debate. Well, and they can just say, like, sorry, you're not a part of NATO. Like, this sets a precedent with the next country that's not a part of NATO. So that's what they're... That's what they're saying, but it's pretty fucking horrific. Two million people have already fled, uh, I think mostly to Poland at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's still what? I mean, tens of millions of people in the country. Yeah, we don't even want the optics of us and our aircraft or even their aircraft flying out of Ramstein and stuff. There's a whole, we're very worried about setting this yeah, guy oh, off. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of weird issues, but... It just goes to show you, well, first off, it's why we don't want crazy people to have nukes. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want Iran <laughs> to give, give nukes because you're crazy and you have nukes that's uh, homeless, beaked up on speed and a machete. Right. And my kids' party's at the beach this year, you know. <laughs> so he's crazy, he's got nukes, and everyone is freaked out yeah. about freaking him out. Yeah. So what we were talking about earlier, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, etc. cetera, I, I don't know how much I can say, so I'll be very vague about it, but uh, some of uh, Christie's um, uh, pr pr more prominent clients have uh, approached the company to do a little research and see what of our competitors have pulled out of the Russian market, because um. we're considering doing the same. But it's a, it's a domino effect, right? Like one company does it, the next company has right. to. Right, you look like an asshole if you don't. Yeah, you have to. It's like the black box for Black Lives Matter on Twitter. One guy does it, fine. But oh, once the, everyone the, the, starts yeah. doing it, then you Sorry. become the outliner. Black box. Yeah. Uh, for the record, I was told to do it and told Chris to fuck off, <laughs> by the way. Thank fucking God I didn't wear a mask. And thank God I didn't stop hiking on horse trail. And thank God I told Black Lives Matter to suck my dick. Yeah. Gay, 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 gay. Uh, early and often. But, but you did have that live show in Russia. That, that was a mistake. Yeah, uh, looking yes. back. But I'm playing Sun City instead. <laughs> oh, I switched the venue. Mike got it worked out. <laughs> well, I'll also say watch your old tweets because this isn't just about getting canceled from like hosting the Oscars. If you're a journalist or, you know, maybe you live in Russia and you have a years old tweet um, and you're a Russian citizen, they'll get you on that too. It's retroactive. Like they'll throw you in, or in prison. Yes. Shit. So can we get careful. a can we get a better helmet for the war correspondence instead of mm. that weird powder blue mm. Darth Vadery sort yeah. of thing? Yeah, we need a better helmet, like like a, a better looking helmet or a more yeah, I mean, safe helmet. I, 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 first off, I don't that thing's Ooh. doing as much as the hard hat is when the I beam <laughs> falls from the fifty second floor. Like I don't think that's going to do I, a I lot. Got, I got the answer: mm. switch hitters, batter helmet. Mm. Like for you know, oh, with the, the two both, ears, both yeah, flaps, both sides. You know yeah, I mean? that way you got the coverage, the brim. Yeah, you know what I mean. What team we going with? Uh, Christ. I mean, well, Yankees feels. Do, you know, do people even know now. that Cleveland's the Guardians now? Get that out there. Oh, yeah, sure. Get, get the, the Guardians go. Yeah. Two birds. Yeah, that is. It's not a flattering helmet. It's just, yeah. it's just not, you know, yeah. it's like, like seeing a guy wearing a motorcycle helmet with no full face or right. no visor yeah. on it yeah. just kind of looks lame. Yeah. Is it because they want it to look like you couldn't be mistaken for a soldier under any circumstances? I think it's the batting helmet. Right. That's, uh, <laughs> that's some of it. Whatever team wins the World Series that that's, year. Yeah, that's Send good. off a bunch of Braves helmets. Yeah. Do you know how good looking you have to be? to wear a motorcycle crash helmet or a car crash helmet with no visor and no full face anything. Mm. And then you have to pull be it off. fucking stunning uh, to do that. Yeah. And it still doesn't work. I mean, Evil Knievel used to jump like that. Think oh, yeah, back he, in he the day. Have, you know, Fonzie. Oh, yeah. Sure. Fonzie, Fonzie never had the... Even yeah. Fonzie couldn't pull it he off. He can't pull it off. It's no. never been done. <laughs> well, let's talk about somebody else who couldn't pull something off recently. Poor guy. Tony Hawk, recovering from a broken bone. I'm going to show you the x-ray, not an actual bone poking through anything, but the x-ray is fascinating. Uh, the professional skateboarder shared an unfortunate... It is. Say, what is the show? It's, it is. Uh, this unfortunate update on his Instagram. Go ahead and put that up. About his... Look at that. Mm. Look at that. Oh, that's a clean femur break. Yeah, it's exactly that's what it is. That's how Vinny did his uh, boat. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's shiplap bone. Uh, well, <laughs> it is. Uh, you could take it down, but I did want you to see that. I he's coming, for that he's shit. coming yeah. in here soon enough. Is he? Hopefully. Is he? <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Now. Um, his Instagram said, well, yesterday sucked. I broke my elbow 20 years ago and managed to make a full comeback. This recovery of a broken femur will be much harder because of its severity and my age. But he's I'm up for the 50 challenge. 50 something. 53. Right? He continued saying, there's a strange irony. Now, I didn't know this. There's a strange irony that this happened on the eve of HBO releasing a trailer for Until the Wheels Fall Off. That's Sam Jones' documentary about his about Hawk's life and career. Which Anything from publicity. That's right. <laughs> which is basically about how I do what I do at my age. Um, Hawk also discussed a promise he made to himself many times before that he will not stop skating until he is physically unable. Well, he is now. Dave yeah. might be I mean, here. That, He's on a couple of it. crutches, yeah. I don't know if it's his right or his left leg, because if it's mm. your right leg, you can drive a car okay, right. an automatic. You just need, mm. all you need is the brake yeah, and the gas on the right leg. You can't drive goofy foot. But um, <laughs> he is, I, he's a real nice guy. I did Toyota Grand Prix with him a million years ago. I think we went out one night and had in like Long Beach, you know, like the night before the race with like Keanu Reeves and Adrian Brody or oh, something nothing. like that. It was just a re- drop something. It yeah. was really a cool. Yeah, that was that was fun. Tony like picked us all up in his souped <laughs> up Dodge. No, he has uh Vinny, you're gonna like this. He has the uh Dodge SUV with the Viper engine in it. Oh uh, yeah. The crazy yeah. oh God, I'll think of I'll they call think it of an who, SVT, who, I think, or something like that. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good All the dude. boys piled in. All the boys piled in, and we went and had ribs. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's such good, a good night. night yeah. gay. <laughs> gay, 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 uh, let's talk Kelly Clarkson. Her divorce from Brandon Blackstock has been finalized. And Adam, I know you you like these kind of stories. Vinny, you probably like it too. The 39-year-old singer will pay her ex a one-time payment of $1.3 million, as well as monthly child support. Monthly child support for their two children, $45,601. What, Vinny, what would your, when you were nine, your right. parents got divorced, what do you think <laughs> the child support would need to be? Somewhere between zero and... <laughs> A hundred bucks a month? Yeah, I think I would have got like a pair of tough skins every four years. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say every month. What are you, a Rockefeller? Yeah, uh, 44. 45,600 every month. Over a half a million dollars Yeah. Yeah. Um, although Clarkson gets to keep the Montana property, Black Sox going to stay there and pay her two grand a month until June while he stays. In addition to the one-time payment, Clarkson will also have to pay her ex $115,000 in spousal support per month until January 31st, 2024. So he's like in her cabin or something and yeah, not and not in Montana. Not leaving. But he has to pay her two thousand dollars a month until June. Oh oh for, for yeah. rent. Yeah. So he gets one point three million, a hundred fifteen thousand in spousal support, and forty five grand a month for the kids. Does she make her bones touring or does she make her bones with her talk show? Or is her talk, talk show still on? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, she's like a. They I lo- see her at the doctor's office. Yeah. Oh, really? I think people yeah. who don't work worth? love her. The, she she, she, she well, yeah. worth a lot. I think so. I mean, her I albums, I'm sure, have gone year double five platinum. Or something, right? But also her music. I mean, I don't know how much of that uh, American Idol owned or whatever. But I mean, she's a hit maker. Can you name a hit? Yeah. The trouble with love. Wait, hang on. Can Hold you on. name a hit? Yeah, I can. Really? Since you've been gone, since that's one. Either, since you've been since gay, since you've been gay, yeah. Yeah. You've been gay. <laughs> my life would suck cock without you. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. She that's as much as I got. All right, next. Story. Uh, okay, so this is kind of sad. Um, has anyone seen Phil Collins lately? Oh, he's not well. He is yeah, not looking I'm going to yeah. show you. He's, he's, so he's, Ill. he's been declining for a while now, and he's now touring as the Genesis frontman. Uh, but he's sitting in a chair in what's going to be their final tour. Um, although he remains seated throughout the performance at Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin, uh, Colin still managed to sing the hits. Um, I'm going to show you a clip. This is kind of more of a Jumbotron clip, so go ahead and make that full screen, yeah. Kind of hanging back in the chair. Mm-hmm. Gay, 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 g
What does he have? Uh, so fucking couple, sweet voice. <laughs> yeah, a couple years. I guess 2007. Um, that's when a lot of this began. He had nerve damage from a spinal injury that affected his, uh, impacted his vertebrae, and it's kind of confined him to a wheelchair. Can I say this? You still can sing a little bit. Yeah. You, but you kind of bum the audience out. Yeah. Unless, because oh. no one wants to see you performing from a wheelchair. Suspended. No. Oh. Better. Dave Grohl. Dave Grohl's Rock and That's Roll right. Throne. That's yeah. right. You go talk to Tony Hawk. Yeah. yeah. Get that get walking that cast. Yeah. yeah. Slap it on your right or left leg. Go out there and sit in the Rock and Roll Throne. <laughs> yeah. And this do literally. It from there. Yeah, then because, it becomes value yes, added at yes. that point. This is a chair. This is an office chair that they rolled out. I mean, it's just a chair. It's a bummer. It's yeah. yeah. The, the bottom line is he was a, a pretty good singer when he was drumming at the same time. So this is a lot less work. Right. Yes, so he could do the same That's thing with a, a lot point. less work. All the guys who drum and sing, my, I tip my cap to mm. them. Mm-hmm. I could never do that. You got him. You got Don Henley, right? Yeah, of course. And Levon one. Helm. Levon yeah. Helm. Yeah, and uh, of course, most famously, the guy from the Romantics. Right. <laughs> most famous. That guy. Right. Yeah, the I guy. Mean, well, they're well, obviously bigger <laughs> yeah. than the Eagles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that guy, yeah, What's bigger than the band, bigger than the Eagles. What's the name again? You know what it is. His I, name I, is I do, but I'm asking his, you. His name is Guy Gay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be a guy named Guy Gay, yeah, you really, right? You really did know. <laughs> and then his PE co- Wait a minute. Gay is the last name, you Gay, know. Uh, there's guy. plenty of guys in the yeah. NFL that's a Marvin Gay. That's right. And then Guy's a name. And then you, there's got to be some guys named Guy Gay. And then when Just law of averages. When he's 13, his PE coach is reading the roster out and they do it back. Right, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. So Smith, he's like, a, Alan. But, uh, gay guy, gay guy. <laughs> you know Hello. Else was that? You know Raise your hand. Things? If you're a gay guy, yeah. got any yeah. gay guys out there? Hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Dustin. That's all right. My bad. Uh, you know who else was a drummer who sang? Uh, the dude from Three Doors Down. Mm. That Superman song. If I go crazy, then will you still call me super For gay? gay. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> wow. That's good. <laughs> Find me that Romantics video. I love that fucking guy. Romantics fucking cooked. Yeah. yeah. And that guy was great. And he was he was drumming yeah. the whole time. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's impressive. And you always think of the drummer as kind of like the loner in the back. He has the plexiglass around him. He's in his own little world. Whoa! But, oh. No, no, finish. I just I'm done. Something. I just Please. Something. No, I'm Please. sorry. So I was inappropriate. I insist. In the movie Almost Famous, the drummer never speaks. That's their running that's right. joke. That's right. Yes. Until uh, yeah. the plane's the going plane down. The plane's about to go down and he screams out, I'm, I'm gay. gay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gina, thank you for yeah. making that. I wouldn't have yeah. got there if it wasn't oh, for you. I'm so glad you did. So, yeah, Phil's kind of holding the uh, mic stand like a kind of like a third leg cane thing he does i saw a 2019 clip he's in the chair he looks a little better but he comes out and says like sorry you know i'm in the chair but we're gonna have fun Uh, so he's been doing this for a couple years this will probably be it he's pretty frail there but he still could kind i mean if it's an iphone video but he could kind of sing but wait one more thing with drummers because the (laughs) pam and tommy lee thing is on my wife finished it she didn't she doesn't know enough about tommy lee it's like honey the thing and guys are not gay. For, we were watching this thing. The guy was steering the boat with his cock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, he, this guy had, he had the hugest hog in the world. I can't understand why he was upset about this whole yeah. thing. But, you know, you're watching this thing. She's asking me questions. And I'm trying to explain to her. I was like, honey, they used to bring him out on stage in a cage with his drums. And Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah. It's flipping upside down and sideways. And Tommy is not missing a beat. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. It's it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And this Sebastian Stan guy, holy shit. He's the one who plays Tommy. He's yeah. ripping on the drums. Yeah. yeah. It's uh it's a good series. We watched it. We didn't have the sound. We watched it in the green room in between shows a couple weekends ago. No good. Yeah, we need to yeah. we need to crank it. Because it ended sound. last night and it's it's a it's great. You know, Pam won't watch it. She doesn't oh, want, yeah. and it is very, very unauthorized. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I am going to talk about her. We have the romantics, oh, good. by the way. Yeah. This song's good, too.
that you keep when you're talking in your sleep? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, forgot that's their other hit. All right. Sorry, Gina. Go ahead. No, it's a great song. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about Pam. Yeah, because she is. She was not happy. She will not watch this uh, series. And she plans to tell her life story, timely, in a new Netflix documentary. Her son Brandon Thomas Lee is a producer on what's been dubbed the definitive documentary about the pop culture icon. Uh, according to the New York Post, Pam was completely against the Hulu series. She won't watch it. She thought, um, even though Lily James, who plays her f- phenomenally, um, <clears throat> reached out to her, uh, not interested, and does point out that Pam is like the hero in this story. Nobody listens to her. You know, she's sort of right every time she says, like, oh, don't do this, don't get Bob Guccione involved, don't sue, and then everybody, you know, does exactly the opposite, fucks her over. I know he's got a big hog, Vinny, because he's steering the houseboat with his cock, but what if he could, what if he used his cock as a rudder? Wouldn't that be even a bigger hog? (sighs) Deep water. He'd have to get to the water. His cock would be more like a keel. Oh, keel. Yeah. Yeah, keel cock. Yeah, it's a Mm -hmm. keel cock. I Mm -hmm. mean, a rudder is, you know, You're right. Sorry, go ahead. That's a keel. Has everyone or anyone actually seen the video? Yeah. Oh, dude. uh, I've never seen it. When Adam asked a question that wasn't especially relevant to a later generation, which was what porno was important in your life or uh, sex boat or whatever your example was, I'm like, we didn't really have that. I was like, no, fucking Pam and Tommy Lee. Everyone's everyone I know. How old were you? Well, well, I was 94, 95. Okay. So I was 15. Oh, was my that, God. Was that your first, first No, 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 the first. What was that was the right, one. Let's go around the table. First por- porno. It was. <laughs> I remember it was, mine. It was a genre picture called what? <laughs> Come on. It was a genre picture called Waterfalls. You can probably picture what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what scrambled you. <laughs> I was wondering how Brian got scrambled. I'm the most well-adjusted person in the room. <laughs> he got scrambled with his wet porn. Adam, first, first porn. All right. Um, I had a, like, Super 8. Wasn't mine. Now, none of the, nothing is mine. My first everything is somebody else's because right. my dad didn't have anything. But the first one you saw. First one, <clears throat> the first, all right. First one I ever saw Place was in waterfall. literally my, my buddy Ray's older brother, Rob, had a Super 8 of, like, black and white. It's like a stag film. Yeah, yeah like a stag film. Like, a, geez, a sailor. It was like John Holmes. Right. And but, but, but there's no place to play it. You needed people to clear out. My dad never left the sofa, you know. So my grandparents went out of town, and we went over to their house. And we didn't have a screen or anything. But in my grandparents' bedroom, <laughs> they had this white chest of drawers that had just flush-mounted white drawer sure. fronts. And it ended up being ostensibly... Uh, a screen, sure. and we just went in there and projected it in my grandparents' bedroom. And then at some point, that was like 16, I was always fucking around. At some point, like halfway into it, I went and pulled the middle drawer out like eight inches and went, 3D! <laughs> <laughs> and everyone went, sit the fuck down! We're watching porn. And then later on, I ended up with the porn reel, yeah, but no projector. Oh. So I would find myself in the bathroom, <laughs> and I was like holding up. It's super eight. It's like eight millimeters, yeah. less than half an inch, you know. And I was holding it up to the light, and I was like, "Jesus Christ, John Holmes's dick is bigger than mine, even in this picture." <laughs> <laughs> I was making stupid jokes when I was fucking sixteen. Good, but that You're was good. my. That's then I, I graduated to B- uh, Bobby Hollander presents. Sure, I can't yeah. remember, and then. Personal uh, touch. Sex boat. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, Taboo too. Right. And what about you, Gina? First porn. The first thing that even remotely looked like porn that I ever saw was on Skinamax back in the day, you know, like at, at night, Cinemax after midnight would show what, like softcore, Lady Chatterley's Lovers. Oh, that's oh, not yeah. that, That's not real. Yeah, that's the first thing I ever saw. Mm-hmm. That's not porn? What do you got, Vinny? He was plowing her on the back of a veggie of fruit truck. Uh, it doesn't count. Oh. I, I actually, my first one was a classic um, and didn't know it was a classic at the time. We went to Baton Rouge, Plank Road, uh, 15 years old, and uh, Debbie Does Dallas. Oh, that is a classic. In. Yeah, and who knew that that was going to be you know, one of the biggest? Yeah. Yeah. The hedgehog is in it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's all downhill after that. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. blow all your minds. Mm. Do you know who was there with me when I saw my first porno? Waterfalls. Mm. The genre picture. Tom Brady. I knew you were going to say that. Tom Brady I was in the room. Knew you Tom were Brady, say that. the goat. The goat was that, in the room. That is not gay. <laughs> no. That is 
perfectly not gay. Hardly anyone was blacking off. <laughs> Why was he in the room? It was, I, he was, he was the, I don't know if you're going to believe me or not. He was a good athlete. He was on the baseball team. And uh, I was not a good athlete. I was the scorekeeper for the baseball team. And after a game where I was in the locker room and there's no one else there and someone, some, one on the team, not Tom, I think it was Jason Zakos, had a, uh, had a porno, waterfalls, and he popped it in. There was a video, there was a TV in there for watching film or whatever. And uh, we got a few minutes of uh, waterfalls. But wow. Think, think about this. We all watched our first porn with other dudes. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. you're harder than a 10 penny nail and you can't do anything with it. Yeah. You know, because... I was more of an eight penny, but I get what you're saying. I, I gotta say, yeah. So I had what I've never seen the Pam and Tommy Lee, like in its, oh. yeah, me either. In its, oh, that was seminal. Well, what it, seminal, what, se, seminal vesicle. What I was, um, <laughs> that was, that was, that was there's the scorekeeper. That might have been that year. That might have been the same year. Bald Brian, not bald Brian. Oh, no, thick head of hair. Brian. Yeah, look at that. The so, I I said I'm a conscient. I I interviewed Tommy mm. and maybe Pam, and you know found out the tape was stolen mm -hmm. and put it up, and and I was a conscientious objector. Good for you. Same I with did me. what uh, Coca Cola is doing yep. with Russia. Yep. I'm pulling out. Yep. I said uh, <laughs> I don't care. I'm not going to watch this as an objection to this ill-gotten gain. Good. That lasted for uh. a, a period of time, but then I went on the road, and you know it's like you're so weak, you're so vulnerable, yeah. yeah. You know when you're on the road, it. you know. Beat you down. And Drew and yeah. I were doing University of Pennsylvania, and we got back to the hotel room late. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I was just sitting in my hotel room. It was cold outside, yeah. you know. And I, I turned on the you TV. You remember this night very well. I do. As I remember, because I turned on the TV, it was, it was like a, it was like outside. a. I was, it was lonely. I, was, I needed the comfort. So I, I needed the human touch. It was on TV? Uh, well, you turn on the hotel TV, and it comes up with the, oh, with the selection, the with the nice. menu. And there it was. You know what I mean? And I was like, it's been a couple of years. I, f I feel like I, I honored. Mm. You know, I what's made, done is done. What's done is done. Can't put it back in the corral. So I bought it, oh, boy. and it was the heavily edited version oh, of it. Oh, that'll teach you. But you end up watching the whole thing for 14 bucks, and then it was like, ah, oh, fuck. That wasn't even yeah. pud worthy. <laughs> well, so, you find out in the show that they did end up, according to the show, Pam convinced Tommy, who did not want to do it, to just give the rights over to this, this internet company because the guy said, you don't sell it to me, then it'll stay out everywhere. You can't do anything about it. If you sell it to me... I control it. I put it behind a paywall, and that way it makes it much harder for people to see. And if that's your goal to get less people to see it, you got to give it to me. Yeah, this was like a big Marriott or Hilton or something, mm. and it was right, right there well, in the menu. And that's why you got the edited version. Mm -hmm. I I can't watch that shit when like we hear about um, like revenge porn or like you know Jennifer Lawrence's uh, nudes off her phone. I I'm, I can't. I, I'm not into it. Yeah. Freaks me out. Yeah, it's a live. You feel. Feels intrusive. Yeah, she didn't something. want that out there. Yeah, I agree. All right, um, but I also don't necessarily agree with this. Not only is Pam doing a doc, she's going to make her Broadway debut All right. mm -hmm. in one of my favorite musicals, Chicago. Mm -hmm. She's going to play. If you saw the movie, she's the Renee Zellweger part of Roxy. It's going to hit the stage April twelfth. Uh, and long list of women have played Roxy: Melanie Griffith, Christy Brinkley, Brooke Shields. Ashley Simpson and Erica Jane. Do you know who that is? I'm afraid I do. Tell us. She's a real housewife. Okay. She's the one whose husband, the lawyer, got in some serious shit. Oh, that one. So stealing that's where from we're at. Embezzlement or something. Right? Stealing from the victims or, yeah, whatever. Yeah. The, okay. yeah. Well, that's where we're at with stunt casting. Mm. Mm. Okay. Uh, there is one more I do really want to show you since we've been talking about shipwrecks the past couple days. Mm -hmm. Do we have time? Mm -hmm. Okay. So about 107 years after Explorer Ernest Shackleton's ship was crushed by ice while he was traveling in Antarctica in 1915, the vessel has been found. And not just found, it is in shockingly pristine well, it's condition. <laughs> it's Exactly. So I'm going to show you a couple of the pictures. It's frozen in time. It is crazy. Um, People reports that in order to find the ship, an expedition team made use of the coordinates from the original captain who wrote it down when the vessel sank. It only ended up being four miles away from where they thought it was going to be, 10,000 feet underwater in the Weddell Sea, which is the northernmost part of mainland Antarctica. And we're looking at the pictures. Even the, the name on the ship is 
perfectly preserved. Um, the most What's amazing. What's the name of the ship? Endurance. endurance. Oh, endurance. Huh, ironic. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You can see it from the <clears> stern, <throat> and like Brian said, one of the factors playing a huge role in its preservation is that it's super cold. Um, the shipwreck will now be protected as a historic site, and it will not be disturbed. So after it's looted, it's yeah, ten thousand right. feet below the surface. Anyone who can get to it, you know, like some troubled teens going to happen by and spray Graffiti. paint the side of it. It's ten thousand feet under the water. Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be it was fine. pretty incredible because he saved every one of his crew. Well, I did that, hear they it's all. It's an amazing you, story. Of course, I, you know I, this. I, they I, all I, abandoned I've, I've ship. Well, you got it. You love boats. Tell me about it. <laughs> Tell well, us. Shackleton, when they got stuck, you know, he they they had to dismantle pieces of everything. He made these makeshift uh, sleds. Uh, they ended up living on some of the dogs that were on the ship. Yeah, you know, they happens. had to eat with whatever they had to. And he had to make his way over these, you know, mountains that they never thought they could make their way. Finally got to some sort of civilization and got help back to get everyone else. Wow. And no one died. And he was never he was never given his due for doing that because it was during World War One, and we were romanticizing war at the time, right? It, it, we always romanticized war because that's how you got more people to go. And people were like, what were they doing out there anyway? And why, why was he doing this? You didn't really have to go and, and all this kind of stuff. So no one ever really talked about Shackleton from that point on, but he was this major hero that never got his due. We, we talk more about Serena's great, great, great uncle um, of... Uh, Robert F. Scott that went to the South Pole and never made it. Okay. Mm -hmm. He gets more more press. Yeah. yeah. More ink. You bring this up when you're eating dinner with Serena, like uh, yeah, again with sexy, Uncle who never start. fucking yeah. sealed the deal. <laughs> yeah, come on. The guy he he went up for a dump, never came back. <laughs> he, that's where that phrase comes from. Um Oh um, really? Yeah, I may be gone for a while. Should mm -hmm. we should we try to pull the boat up? I mean, and like, then whose boat it, right? would it be if we were able to Float it from the There's bottom. No well, of the sea. There's no way they British. can float that. There's no way. Well, they got tons of robotics and stuff now, and some technology. No, no, no. It's water. Long. Remember when oh, they you were built half a fucking kayak? <laughs> and you're, you're, I know something about the sea, sir. I know something. <laughs> Listen, years and years ago, there were three whales stuck, mm -hmm. and the Russians sent a, a big freighter. To, remember these three whales that were stuck, and and they were breaching, and the whole thing. They got stuck in, in the, the ice. Winter. Yeah. Adam saw with the we, gas we station. brought oh, ice man. cutters. We brought everything. We had every country in the world trying to save three damn whales. Mm -hmm. Right? You think they're going to go and get that out? Uh, I don't. I mean, and we, we don't even have Russia anymore helping. Well, what I see the question is: is what's above it? If it's just ice. eighty feet of thick worth of ice, yeah. then that's probably an issue. Really? But I saw a story about and Chris. You can find this doc. I think it was a P-38, which is like the coolest plane of World War II, came out right at the end of World War II. The P-38 was essentially, if you want to know what that plane looked like, it was essentially the one Howard Hughes crashed right. in yeah. the movie. Yeah. That's essentially what it looked like. And it was a like a tank buster. And it had like a twin boom rear whatever and a mm -hmm. big fucking cannon in the front. And it was fast. And it, it came out toward the end, but one of those <laughs> twenty three skidoo. <clears throat> yeah, it's it, it's just a piece of fucking machinery with a big fifty caliber whatever in the front, just for shooting at German tanks. Either way, one of those went down in the uh, it was North or South Pole or somewhere in there. Got buried under like eighty feet of ice. And they drilled the hole and they pulled the thing up like piece by piece and they fucking restored it oh, in a shit. hangar and it and it flew again. But I wow. can't remember what that I cannot remember what that dock is called. I'm pretty sure it was a P thirty eight. Anyway. Well, if you zoom in on the picture we're looking at, that plane has already been canceled. Oh right. Um, because of the image in between the twenty three and the skidoo. It's American Indian. It sure is. Oh my. Yeah. I think they built those three miles from here at Lockheed, where oh, yeah. the Burbank Airport is. Is uh, Bob Hope Airport? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> if memory, <clears throat> if memory serves. He's getting down. He's got a hatchet. He's so, doing the splits. Yeah. God damn. Doing yoga. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I I think I saw it on the History Channel or Discovery. Yeah, the plane was called the Glacier Girl and uh, the the Hunt for the Lost Squadron. Oh. Time Machine, the Hunt for the Lost Squadron might have been it. Was it a P thirty eight? Yeah, P thirty eight F. Yeah, 
and uh, it was buried, and they wow. dug it all out, and they restored it, and they they whatevered it. It's a really interesting, uh, really interesting dock. But um, they, you know, the way they do it, they would have to get the ship up now, is they would have to do it all robotically, and then they'd have to put a bunch of straps under it, and then they'd have to have a bunch of inflatable bags that right. floated it up. Yeah. Now, what you do with the ice after that, I don't know. All right, let's bring it home, uh, Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Sucking cock in a mobile. Gina, Gina. That was the news with Gina Grad. All right, well, the great Joe Coy is here, and he'll be uh, up next. First, I'll tell you about X chair. From the first moment I sat in my X chair, I thought, wow, this is what a real office chair is supposed to feel like. And uh, that's it. I bought one years ago and just used it at my home, and now I'm sitting on one right now. Phil Collins should get one of these. <laughs> oh, yeah. He should. Beautiful. Yeah, because uh, it's got the LMX massage on there and temperature regulation, exclusively designed for X chair. And uh, it'll cool you down as well. It'll warm you up or cool you down. Plus, customized support of X chair's patented dynamic variable lumbar or DVL. Try X chair for yourself risk free for 30 days. Once you realize just how much better it is than your current chair, you'll make the switch. You'll never go back. It is X Chair, right, Dawson? Go to XChairAdam.com now. That's a letter X, Chair, A-D-A-M.com, or call 844-4X-Chair for $100 off your order. X Chair has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month, XChairAdam.com. All right. We'll take a break. We'll come back with a one-on-one with the great Joe Coy right after this. The Adam Carolla Show presents Joe Coy's Birthday Cocktail Party for June 2nd. Let's see who's invited. We welcome 18th century philosopher, the original sadist, Marquis de Sade. Rolling Stones drummer, Charlie Watts is here. American actor, Stacy Keach. Serial killer, the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe. Dana Carvey is here. Race car driver, Kyle Petty. From the Howard Stern Show, Beetlejuice. Let's welcome, from Cypress Hill, Be Real. Wayne Brady joined the party. Justin Long. And Jerry Mathers as the Beaver. Joe Coy is on the Adam Carolla Show. Joe Coy, joy in yep. studio. Always great to see our friend Joe. Thank you. Um, such a friend of the show and a personal friend for so many years. And, you know, it struck me when they said, oh, Joe Coy's coming in. I thought, well, let's do a one-on-one with Joe Coy because we always bring Joe in and he does all his crazy characters and it's funny as shit. But I thought... I never really interviewed Joe. We bring him in and yell dance at him, but uh, (laughs) a lot's changed between then and now, and I think we should uh, really uh, scratch your lotto ticket. I love that. Tell me about your story. Thank you. So first off, you know, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Incredible success. Amazing, you know, playing the forum two nights at the forum, uh, coming up March 25th, 26th, by the way, and before that, Tucson, Arizona, Tucson Arena. March 20th, and you can get your tickets, by the way, uh, because he's got his fourth stand-up special on Netflix coming out. But I'm shooting that at the forum, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. I I love your story because, and let's let's start with, you wanted to do a Netflix special. They didn't really want a Netflix special, so you went and did one anyway at your own cost. So this is what happened. Mm -hmm. It was Netflix made an announcement that they were buying, they were going to make original specials instead of like, Licensing. What year are we at? That was at 2000, 2015, they announced that they were going to mm-hmm. do a bunch of uh, Netflix originals. Mm-hmm. So that means they were going to tape all of 2016, and then in 2017, they were going to put one out every week. And they went after everybody. They went after, you know, got people out of retirement, you know what I mean? Seinfeld. They went after... Uh, uh, I get Ray Romano, the Chris mm-hmm. Rocks, and uh, you Chappelle, and everybody. They went after everybody. Now and it was it, a huge. It was a huge. Uh, uh, how, how do I say it? It was a lot of big names. We're going to do some hour specials for Netflix. Legacy names. Yes. And and at this point, 
Are you selling out night after night at clubs, yes. or are you graduated into theater? I was, I was doing multiple theaters and also arenas at that point. Oh, you're doing arenas at that point? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I was doing multiple theaters. I'm sorry. You're right. I was doing multiple theaters. And still doing the 14 shows at the Irvine Improv kind of Hold thing? Hold on. You know what? You're you're right. Yeah, I, I don't even know my own story. You're right. I was doing... Uh, extended weeks at improvs. That's what I was right. doing. So I was doing like 14 shows in a row at an improv in Dallas, Texas. And then I'll go to Irvine improv and do 18 there. And then I right. go to Cobbs in San Francisco, do 18 there. But, but, but people didn't know Joe Coy in terms no. of a household name at all. The fans did sold out all the shows, Yes, but we're at that point in your career. Yeah. That's where I'm at. Right. And, and, I, and I was also 45, mm -hmm. and it was also like my 30th year or something like the 29th year in stand-up. I started in 89. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, my son is now like, I don't know how old he was at that time. I think he was like 12 at that time. And I was just mm -hmm. like, I got to make a move. Like, like something's got to happen. Someone's got to help push me over. And uh, Comedy Central offered, and I was like, I didn't want to go again to Comedy Central because my first two specials were there. No one knew about it kind of just got shelved. Mm -hmm. And I knew that everyone was going to Netflix, especially when they made that announcement. I was like, I want to be with that group of comics right there. I mm -hmm. deserve to be on that one. And we thought they were going to make an offer because I thought with what I was doing on the road, they were going to say, yeah, of course. Right. And they said, no. <laughs> and then we, we kept inviting them, Adam. We kept, like, kept inviting them. I kept saying, come, just come to a show. And about seven, like seven times we would invite. I, I even told him I'd fly you guys. I'll get a private jet. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I go, I'll get you a private jet and I'll fly to San Francisco. Come see the set and I'll get you back on the plane and you fly back. You'll be in bed by tonight. Just, right. just please see the set. Like, especially in San Francisco, I really wanted them to see what I could do because I was mm -hmm. crushing in San Francisco. And they, they, they were like, yeah, we'll do it. And then at the last second they said no. And then to the point where the, the last time they said no, they go, you know, what? we're going to go and pass. And uh, we already have our roster filled for 2017. So we're just going to go and pass and we'll look again when this is done. When we're mm -hmm. done taping this, we'll come after him again. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> I didn't even understand why they said no, to be honest. I was like, I, I don't get it. I'm crushing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not all merit-based, yeah. I think, uh, is what my answer would be. It made no sense, Adam. So I paid for it. <laughs> you paid. Was it 500K? It was, I told you. Not to say anything on Not to on ever there. say anything. <laughs> That's why I asked. <laughs> I fucking forgot. I do it all the time. Every time we have this conversation, I go, don't mention how much I paid. <laughs> it was a lot of money. It was a lot, especially when you're uh, a road comic. Oh, yeah. And you're, you know, and that, that was basically my life savings. It, right. It really was. It's everything that I scratched and saved up for. And, and, uh, and I was like, uh, my, thank God, God bless my manager, Joe. He was like, you know what? Screw it. Let's shoot it ourselves. Mind you, there's no, everything's streaming at this point. Like I can't make DVDs and make my recoup my money. There's no blockbuster. I can't sell them in stores. Yeah. So it's like, I shoot it. If it doesn't happen and they don't buy it, then I just give it away for free on YouTube. It's going to be the most expensive special on YouTube. But I was like, I have to do this. Where did you shoot it? We shot it in Seattle. I'm from Seattle. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was at the uh, Moore Theater. Love that place. Iconic, you yes. know. And and I knew I knew I had, it was big enough, but it was also small enough to, like does that make sense? A little under 2,000 seats yeah. or something. And then when you kills with all the cameras, you know, right. you, you get right. about 14 right. in there, 15. Right, you got to clear out some space yeah. for the cameras. And, and I was like, and I got to make it beautiful. And I remember they kept, my manager was like, oh my God, let's just shoot it at a comedy club. It would be so much cheaper. But I go... Yeah, but then it's going to look like a comedy club with a bunch of cameras. Mm -hmm. Like these, this is we're going up against. We're not going up against, but we're, if if we do sell this to Netflix, it's got to look just as good as Chris's and Dave's and everyone. It's got to look like they paid for it. Yeah. So we're going to go above and beyond. <laughs> like, so I I went above and beyond. I I, I tapped into. I, I literally cleared my bank account for that special. Well, I mean, I think everyone loves the story of betting on yourself. Yeah. And also, I think people forget how long you were knocking around. Yeah. And then it kind of gets you to this place that I'm always have kind of mixed emotions on. Like on one hand, you got so much done. Uh, you said you were 45 or whatever. Yeah. You were in your forties and you were successful, but you hadn't broke, so to speak, yeah. you know, in Hollywood parlance. 
And I part of me is like when I hear a guy and he's a personal trainer, but he also wants to be a country star yeah. and he's 45, my head is, is, hey, man, if it hasn't happened yet, put the guitar away. Yeah, and just keep lifting weights. Yeah, but there's so many stories like your own. Yeah. That I don't know what I don't know what to do. So it's probably case by case. I, and and here's the best part that I need to tell you too, because this one's going to make you go, "What the fuck?" Is when they found out, even though they told me no, and then they found out that I was shooting it. It was like three days before I was about to shoot it. They called my team and they said, "Hey, we found out Joe Coy's shooting the special. We really want to be clear. We don't want it." <laughs> that's a that's a true story, Adam. <laughs> wow. Like they were trying to like free themselves. Like we don't want any kind of confusion. We don't want you to think like, hey, go shoot it and we might look at it. We really don't want it. And that's right. what they said to me. And wow. I remember just looking at my math. I cried. I remember crying when they said that. Because I was like, well, where am I going to go? And you're already pot committed at yeah. this point. I mean, we already hired the director and, and, and the producer. And, you know, the, I just paid like $12,500 for these stupid letters behind me. Right. Like, like, like no one knows that. Like when that, when they say cut, they just break it and throw it in the trash. <laughs> like, you know, to, and, and by the way, I didn't, I was so attached to the special. You're going to love this, Adam. I was so attached to the special that when they said cut and they started hitting the, the, my, my, my letters behind me that they made, right. I go, stop, 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 stop. I go, uh, 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 bring it to, bring it to LA. I had to pay another $10,000 for them to break it down, put it in storage because I thought I was going to keep it. And then I ended up throwing it away. <laughs> but like, I was, I was just like, wait, I can't throw away $12,000. Like, but I, I that's what a, happens when you're the executive producer. You're your, just like, you paid for everything and you want it all. Like, I got to recoup this. Your le your letters, your initials make me flash back to early when you gave me the JK hat. Yeah. And I used to wear it and everyone would go, Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It made sense. If the I worst was advertisement it. for me. <laughs> you got Jimmy Kimmel a bunch of free advertising. <laughs> yeah. So I've I've always look. I like the bet on yourself part. I like the can do spirit. I I I like the attitude and and I I love where it brought you. So now you've shot this special at considerable expense. I won't say the amount. Yeah. But it considerable. Well, you already did. Uh, did I? Yeah. I yeah, said considerable did. expense. I, so right. I, I had to become when when I shot. And they it, Adam, said we don't we don't want we it. don't want it. And and, and then and then Shannon, uh, Ma, uh, Michelle, uh, my producer, she was like, "We want to make you exactly what you want. So just tell us what you want." And I literally watched every single special, Adam, every single special, and and I picked picked what I loved from each special. And I, and I was like, I want this in this special. So there was a reverse shot on Jerry Seinfeld where it was like below aiming up and you could see the second balcony uh -huh. and it was a wide shot. And I mm -hmm. go, that's an important shot. I go, if we're going to cut to, I want that shot. So I wrote that down. And then uh, the lighting, I forgot whose lighting it was, but I just remember I was so in love with the lighting and I told her about that. Uh, oh, and then, uh, and this was the best one, Adam. Mm. Dana Carvey in, uh, I think it was Santa Barbara, somewhere. Mm -hmm. It was one of his specials out there. And the sound was incredible. Mm -hmm. It was the best sound of any special I've ever heard. And I go, and I, I remember saying to her, I go, why is this sound so good? Like, why does this sound like I'm in the audience? And she goes, oh, he just hired more mics. We can do that. I mm -hmm. go, I want all of the mics. Mm. Every single mic that you can get me, get it. And that's exactly what we did. We had two balconies. And uh, we mic'd all the way up to the back wall on the second balcony. So like when people watch that special, they go, oh, it sounds fake. I'm like, no, it's because you're actually hearing everyone. Yeah. Most, most, most when they, uh, when they produce uh, specials, they'll just put floor, uh, floor mics and that's right. it. Or put a couple booms mm -hmm. and face outward. Like mm -hmm. you want to pick up all the sound. Like, yeah. I mean, attention to detail. It's it's really interesting that you watched all these specials mm -hmm. and you sort of cherry picked. I like the shot. I like the sound. Yeah. And, and and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, none of this is. But you're the luck. same way, Adam. Well, like like when I watch you, right? Like like you you know you you left. Well, you didn't leave. I, I think you got fired. I don't know what happened, but you were on like the biggest radio station. A little format switch and, there, yeah. And then you all of a sudden went to your garage and just built this dynasty. But like, but you're hands on, like you make this look like you, like your logo is you, like it's so much detail. You know what I mean? Like the M3 for, for your L's. It's like, you gotta, 
You got you got uh, you know cars inside. Like we're inside of a garage. Like this is Adam. Like like that's that's important. And and yeah. that's what I was doing with this special. It's like wait a minute. If I'm gonna make this and I'm paying for it, then I'm gonna make this me. This is me. We're not gonna cookie cutter this. We're not gonna just make anything and sell it. I gotta sell me. And that's what that was. Yeah. Well, it's all good except for the part where Netflix said they didn't <laughs> want it. I mean. But I knew I had something. Right. I knew I had something. I knew I had to show them that they needed to say yes. Well, how did that work? Because I have found in Hollywood, especially when they say no, they just go no. Yeah. And then it's a hard pass and they don't go, geez, I was wrong. I'd misgaged this whole situation. This is on me. I, don't, I mean, when I looked at my numbers, it's like, you know, and I'm not making these numbers up. Like if you... You know, if you ask the improvs, like who's got the most shows sold, they're going to say Joe Coy. Like, yeah. And it's like, I knew I had the numbers and I knew my demo. Like I, I looked at it. Like every day I'm looking at this demo and they always, Hollywood thinks I only speak to one audience. It's like me and Chris Loxamana. That's it. It's like, yeah. that's, a, that's all I speak to. And maybe the nursing staff at Cedar sinai It's like, <laughs> it's like, no, Chris's it's like, mom. yeah, Chris's mom is there. Chris's uncle is at the post office. It's like, no, I speak to everyone. Yeah, well, and like I had to show them that they were wrong. There's not enough Filipinos, thank God, for you to sell out. You know, the Bray Improv's 500 people. Yeah. You can't sell out 14 4, shows yeah. or whatever. There's just not enough of no. Chris's relatives exactly. floating around out there. Exactly. Thank How God. about two forms, 24,000? Oh, my God. You it's, were there, I Adam. I was there. It, it was, it's, it's surreal. It's surreal. And, you know, I will say... In a world where comedians oftentimes don't root for other comedians, Joe Coy, <laughs> Joy, or Joy, so easy to root for. I was uh. so I was tickled pink. I was honored that you invited me out there. That I got to get up on stage, do a couple of minutes. You you were so hospitable. Your family so goddamn nice. Showed me around the place. Yeah. The set was amazing. I mean, your comedy set, not. Oh, the stage looked great too, but yeah. I'm not talking about the giant chain. Okay. Yeah. And it was just, uh, Tiffany Haddish was out there. Yeah. It was just a great night, but I was just, I, my heart was full. I was oh. like, I'm watching you command a place that held 16,000, 14,500. I mean, that, that was a skill because that it, at some point it, it becomes part comedy and part rock and roll at yeah. a certain point when you're playing a venue that is that cavernous and that big and and joe just nailed it it was a great night and i know he's coming back but yes they the executives are always kind of the last to know yeah you know and then when they feel like you're convincing them yeah they start pushing back a little bit because they feel like you're trying to drag them somewhere yeah. and they start doing kind of what a dog does with a rawhide bone chew like you pull one way <laughs> yeah. they start going what is this and they yeah. start pulling the other and then you turn the other direction they start pulling again so yeah. how did you get them over that hump i just i i knew adam like i knew that the routine was strong i knew my point of view was strong and I knew if, if they just see it and if it's shot right, like they're going to love it. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't care that they said the roster was full. They were going to make room for this one. And I remember I cut it up. I was an editor. I didn't even know. I was even a director at one point. I remember when, when I saw that there was no rear camera. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, but it was shooting the first balcony. I was like, I go, we need the second balcony. We got to show how many people are in here. And she's mm -hmm. like, yeah, but we don't have enough space. I'm like, well, then push the letters back. That's why the, the first... Uh, the first taping was so late because we had to physically move the letters back to set that camera up. But like, if you didn't do that, I would have never got that shot. Right. And that's the shot that they used to sell, you know, when they promoted on the queue on, on Netflix queue, that's the shot. Like that's the shot I was begging for. So, so, and so I knew when I, cut, when I, I went in and I cut it myself, I edited it with the guy in the editing bay, but I was picking everything. I knew right when we did it, I go, we have it. Like this is, if they say no to this, then, then it's something other than there's there's another reason why they don't want it and and yeah there's no way you can deny this special well yeah that's the shot right there it's scary you see that yeah shot? it's a beautiful place it has uh, I think it has what they call the Negro balcony at the very top because <laughs> all those old theaters from the 
teens and the 20s and stuff had a whole balcony, which was like the Negro section, mm. they called it back in the day. Yeah, I played there a few times, and all I could do is walk out there and go, Eddie Vedder swung yeah, off man, of that off lighting that balcony rig. right there. Yeah, it was like that... It, it seems that's why I had to do it there to play the same place that exactly. Pearl Jam played. So and, and it you looks see that beautiful. section right yeah. there to the left on the screen, bottom mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. That had a jib that we that they paid for, and they knocked out about five or ten rows, and and which means I would have had to play right the whole time. And I remember looking at her, going, "We got to get rid of that jib." Mm. I go, like, I can't. I need everyone in here if we're going to sell this special. I need everyone. So we got rid of the jib on that. So you you edited, because you have to edit it. I mean, yep. you're not an editor, but you're a comedian, and the timing is so important yep. and all that. So you get this as good as you can get it. Yeah. And then what? I bring it in. First of all, we <laughs> you're going to love this one, Adam. We tried to get uh, bids. We tried to see if other people were going to bid first before we brought to mm -hmm. this. <laughs> sure. And uh, so we, we brought it around, we shopped it around, and we were getting no's left and right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you the names, mm -hmm. but we just got a couple of no's. And then we were like, wait a minute, we thought for sure we were going to get a yes. And then now my heart's pounding because I, I, I didn't want anyone to go back to Netflix going, we passed on it. Right. So I just, I, I looked at my agent, I go, put it on their desk right now. <laughs> like, I don't even want anyone to know that this is out there right now. And we put it on Netflix's desk. And they literally an hour later, like, I'm not even joking, like an hour after they watched it, they called me and said, we're going to put in an offer. Don't shop it around. Wow. And that was seven months after they said no, the last no to me. And once that thing got into rotation on Netflix. They put it in the prime spot. And it was so well received. Yeah. Did the business then really just blow Overnight. up? Overnight. Like Overnight. Overnight. Uh, we were only supposed to do one show in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I ended up breaking Mariah Carey's record. We sold 22,000 tickets. It was the most tickets I ever sold. And, um, and Mariah Carey's record was there. She, I think she had like 21,500. I beat her like by 500 tickets. Wow. Yeah. And, and it was an old record too. It was like, like you literally had to have a residency in this, this venue in order to break that. And that was the Netflix that effect. Was literally, and, and, and it was so funny because every show that we had on sale after it, it aired just completely sold out. Mm. Like, so, and, and then we were adding arena, not arenas, theaters everywhere. And then we were doubling up on theaters. All right. So that's that story. But now we'll bring it back to your humble beginnings yeah. as a young lad out uh, here. And were you Orange County kind of area or where were you? No, I was Vegas. Oh, Vegas. Yep. Mm. And, and that's where and, I was shooting. Uh, that's where I was building my comedy clubs. I was making my own. So where do you, where do you start? If you're talking about Seattle. Yeah. Where, where are you born? Where, where do you go to grade school? Grade school was in the Philippines. Mm. So I was in the Philippines, you know, f from five to 11. Uh huh. Six and, years in. And then the family moves to Seattle, Tacoma, Washington. Yeah. A side thing, which I, I always th forgot, but I think about periodically, is Joe and I first met not on my podcast, but when he would call into my morning radio show as Kobayashi. Oh, dude, I loved it. <laughs> and I loved it. We had Joey Chestnut, the <sighs> eating, the hot dog eating champion. Oh, I loved it. And he'd get on the phone and then Joe- But Kobayashi would, was the original right, hot dog eating Joe's, champion, so I yeah. was angry. And he would talk shit to Joey Chestnut, and Joey Chestnut didn't really know- he knew it wasn't the Kobayashi, but he still felt like someone was talking shit to him. Because <laughs> yeah. it's kind of like how, like, if you go try to talk shit to Howie Long, yeah. he doesn't know if you're kidding or really, and yeah. all of a sudden we're back in high school. Yeah. And so he didn't appreciate Joe as Kobayashi talking shit. But I didn't know who Joe Coy was. I just, you know, Mike Oggs used to go, this guy does a fucking funny Kobayashi. He'll call in <laughs> in the 8 o'clock hour and we'll get Joey Chestnut. <laughs> and so that's how I met. Joe Coy. Yes. So you moved to the Seattle area when you were 11. Yeah. And what's the what's the plan? So your parents- I want, want to be a to comic. Be, you want to be a comic? Yeah. Based it, on, on what? On Richard Pryor, the tape first, because mm -hmm. that's when someone said, oh, you're a comedian. I didn't know what that was. And it was my friend William at the time, and he, his, he gave me a tape cassette of Richard. Mm -hmm. And I would just listen to that. My mom was so cool. She let me listen to anything. And then Eddie Murphy came out with Delirious. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I fell in love with Eddie Murphy. And I was like, I want to be him. I want to be Eddie Murphy. And, and then five, four or five years later, he, came, he had the Raw tour. 
mm-hmm. and he was selling out arenas. Mm-hmm. And uh, and this is back when there was no Ticketmaster, there was no computers. You had to phone call, mm-hmm. and then you pick up your tickets usually at the at the mall somewhere, like some little right. kiosk or something would be a Ticketmaster kiosk. And I literally had to call using my mom's credit card in her accent because there was no way they're going to question if it's a kid using that credit card on the phone. So I was like, I'd like to get the two tickets to the Eddie Murphy comedy show, please. <laughs> Just two tickets, if you don't mind. Just uh, me and I'm taking a, a friend to the Eddie Murphy. <laughs> oh, of course, ma'am. How many tickets? Just two. <laughs> How would you like to pay, ma'am? Uh, just visa. <laughs> My visa card. Do you, are you ready for the number? <laughs> and literally... Sold me the tickets. Wow. And I went to the mall and picked you them up. You were 15 or? I was like 16. Uh-huh. And went so, to the mall, picked them up, had the bus to the mall, got my tickets. <laughs> so it was just, it was in you like the yeah. whole time. You want to hear the cool thing? Mm-hmm. When we went to Raw, it was at the Seattle Coliseum where the Sonics play. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I remember sitting, I had 15th row. I was 15th row, dead center. It's mm-hmm. beautiful seats. And saw Eddie, you know, Incredible. I remember sitting there looking up to the roof and just saying to my friend, I was just like, I can't believe there's this many. It was my first time ever in a concert. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I can't believe there's this many people to see him. Like, this is ridiculous. Like looking up to the, like, I I thought only basketball teams do these kind of numbers, you know? And then just, just recently, I just sold out that same venue. Mm. The same exact venue that I saw Eddie Murphy in. In fact, it, you know, it was under renovation because they added more seats. It's a hockey team that plays there now, the Kraken. And I sold 14,300. Like, it was, they, they were sitting behind the stage. There were so many Did people. Did you beat Eddie Murphy? I know you fucked Mariah Carey's record up. Now you're going after another person of color? Eddie, I came after you, another one. <laughs> no, I'm joking. So, yeah, I mean. But it was it, just it, a dream come true. Oh, my God. It's, oh, uh, and I sat in the same seats that I sat in with my son and looked up at that room. I go, see that, Joe? That's I remember looking up there saying, I can't believe that this many people are here to see someone. Uh, it's it's all fairy tale like. <laughs> so, but now you're 15, you're living in Seattle or 16. Yeah. Um, you're Filipino. You know, it's it's kind of a two way street. Like times like, suck. You got to remember the time that we live in, the generation that we live in. So time sucks. Yeah. It's it's 1980s. And it's but like I, I just want to say this. Very but, racist time, but but you're living in it as if it's normal and it's accepted. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like my mom is dealing with racism, and that's why you gotta appreciate immigrants that come to this country during that time because it's like, what the fuck are they supposed to do? You know what I mean? Like yeah. I still remember vividly when we won this prize at JCPenney, this free TV, and we're going up the escalator. And to go collect the, the prize, the TV, and this little kid, my because my mom loves little kids. She goes, oh, hi, so cute. Look at the hair. He had blonde hair. Mm-hmm. Blonde hair, oh, so cute. And then he turned around, pulled his eyes back, went, oh, 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 oh. Oh, boy. And, I'd, and I've never seen anything like that. You know what I mean? I didn't know what that is. You live on the military base. You don't see that because we're all mixed up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, and I just remember looking at my mom. I go, what was what that? And then, and then my mom goes, oh, he's just trying to be funny. Mm. And that's her way of dealing with it. And yeah. that sucks, you know? Like, it's hard to put yourself in those shoes in those times and, and, and understand that it's like, wow, we don't... You, she calls herself American, but she can't really feel American because that's how she's dealing with it. And when she watches TV, what's her role model? It's like, she doesn't have role models. Like, what does she do? There's no Instagram. There's no Facebook. You know Well, I mean? you know, speaking of that, I was thinking about it because, you know, we do this thing all the time where we go... You know, little girls of color have never seen a woman of color in the White House, and then they need like a role model, whatever. And my thing is true, but it's like a two way street because you're a young Filipino boy, Eddie Murphy, you're loving, um, you're loving many of the comedians of color. Yeah. And you don't have a role model. (laughs) Yeah. I did. The other direction. Exactly. But it's also the times that we live in, right? Yeah. So like, you know, we had three channels back then. And right. if you had cable, you had to be kind of rich. And and the reason why I was gravitating towards black comedians or or Latino comedians is because they have similar struggles and stories. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I get it. Like I have that Uncle Gus and I and we are poor. And it's like you yeah, know, it's hard Murphy, for me. You can't afford the ice cream. Yeah. Or whatever, and you know, and okay. I related to that. Right. And I got that, you know. So now you're sixteen, living in Seattle. Are you on a base? 
No, we were living off base. Off base. And but it wasn't a good time. It wasn't a good time. And everyone's poor and all everyone's that Everyone's poor. My dad and mom are going through rough times. And my brother has schizophrenia. Oh. And he's beating the shit out of my dad. Ooh. He's punching my mom in the face. Every other week is Is he a little cops. older than you? Yeah, he's eight years older than me. Oh, boy. And, and that's when the divorce happened, when my brother... It's just uncontrollable. It's horrifying. It comes on yeah. usually 19 or 20, like, and it comes on and there's all these night terrors and yeah. all this shit going on. Yeah. And, and it's horrifying for and, you as, and, as and well. And it's crazy because it's literally, uh, what is that door? The revolving door of personalities. Mm -hmm. And every now and then you'll catch Robert, you know, and it's mm -hmm. fun and it's loving. It's fun. And then that door just, it turns that fast and it, and it, and it sucks. Is he around? Yeah. He calls me. And then, you know, and, and it's fun because sometimes he'll call. It's a hard pickup, man. You know what mm, I mean? Yeah. Like, you got to decide when you want to pick up. And you got to really be like, I, I, I like to pick up when no one's around. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I also like to pick up when I'm not about to go on stage or I'm on my way on the road. Right. I got to be, it's got to be like a Monday at a specific time where I have time for that. But he'll call. We'll have fun. We'll laugh. And then boom, he's, he's right back into like, I'm going into detective school and, uh, you know, I'm under, you know, I'm investigating this thing right now. And it's just, like, you know, just hang tight, man. But there's spies looking at you right mm -hmm. now, Joe, because, and you just have to like. He's not listen. on his meds. I don't even think even on his meds. He's, he's that it's, I feel bad talking about him, but, but you know, but that was the, uh, the mental, uh, that was the mental, what am I trying to say? That was the therapy I needed because mm -hmm. I kept it in for so mm -hmm. long. Everyone always goes, do you, do you have siblings? And I would always go, yeah, my two sisters. But I didn't want to say my brother because mm -hmm. they would always go, oh, your sister, where they live? Vegas. And if I said my brother, oh, where does he live? I'm like, oh, Washington still. Oh, what does he do? And it's like, I couldn't lie. Right. So I just, I'd rather just not say it. Right. But now where there's all this awareness, it's like, yeah, you know what? My brother has a mental illness and you know, and so do I because I have to deal with that trauma. Also, you have to worry a little bit when you're 16 that it may kick in at 19 or 20 because mm -hmm. that's how schizophrenia works. It does. So you are living in this poverty and this chaos, yet you have you have your 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 dream of comedy. Yeah. Do you know you're funny? Is that oh hands down, I'm the funniest guy in any room. You know it. Oh, yeah. At, at 11, I knew it. I and is it being reinforced laugh. by your mom or family members My or mom didn't want me to be a comedian at all. Mm -hmm. But I, every year, I was class clown. Every It was just, I was the funniest. I made everyone, Mrs. Kenoyer, my accounting teacher, would always go, Joe, just wait five minutes till the end of the class, and you can do whatever you want. Just mm -hmm. just not right now. Because she would even laugh. I was, I was so funny. But there's a difference between being funny and thinking you can make a living being funny, yeah. which is uh, separated by a large chasm sometimes. Yeah. And like, I always thought I was, I was class clown too, but I was like, but now you got to go do construction because yeah. you're done with high school. Like, I didn't think I could make money doing it. I just think I'd be the funniest guy on the construction site. But you started early. Right out of high school. Right out of high school. Yeah. And, and when you, you know, you are the funniest guy in your, chemistry class but then when you get up on stage things the paradigm shifts a little horrible it did completely yeah just bombed really? all the time yeah because it's a different art form right you got to learn how to write first of all right. <laughs> you know I mean? and then you got to learn how to get in front of people that was scary and then uh and then finding out what you're talking about and who are you on stage that that took years to figure out who i was mm -hmm. and like i said earlier when we first started talking it was a different time mm -hmm. like i had to do what I had to cater to what was normal then, mm -hmm. you know? So doing the, you know, the Kobayashi jokes mm -hmm. and doing that stuff, it, you, you do it because that's, that's what, what, what you think is okay. And, and that is accepted. They don't want to hear my story about being Filipino, but if I can tell you that I'm Asian and this is the only way you'll understand it, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like Pat Morita. Pat Morita was, you know, Mr. Miyagi, but mm. but in real life he was just a stand-up comic that didn't even speak Japanese. Really? Yeah, he didn't speak Japanese. He was, but 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 he lived. It, the only way he can get a role in Hollywood is he had to create that character because yeah. that's all they wanted from him. Probably started on Happy Days with uh, Arnold. Al as Arnold, yeah, yeah, as Arnold, yeah. He was Al. Yeah, and and that, but that, but those are the times that we lived in, and it's like, did he want to do that? Probably not. But then. 
yeah, he did because he's on TV, but it's like, what other roles were they going to give him? They didn't right. want to give him, uh, you know, the, the executive uh, running a, uh, a, a, a or, or a store owner. They didn't want to give him that. They just gave him the role that they thought he should have, which is kind of like, it's kind of fucked up, right, Adam? It's like, <laughs> here's a guy that doesn't even have an accent, but yet, well, it's, but it's the kinda, only way you can perceive yeah. him on TV is he has to have an accent. It's kind of baked into Hollywood, which is big guy, you be the jock, little guy, you be the nerd, Japanese guy, maybe you could yeah. be the accountant. Accountant. Uh, Black guy, you could either be a cop or a criminal. Yeah, <laughs> cop or know. criminal or really good athlete with yeah, potential. That's 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 basically and a, and, and a white woman is going to take you in. Right, that's how Hollywood. Yeah, Sandra yeah. Bullock will take you in. That's that's how Hollywood works. Yeah, and they, they don't work that way. They've evolved now. But so you're, you're well. It took a long time, though. Yes, you you're trying to do stand up as a Filipino comedian. Yeah. And, and every time I would talk about my mom, it would always be like, oh, I didn't get it. It's like, well, can you try and listen? But then I couldn't figure out how to say it in a way where it was relatable. I was mm -hmm. doing like the very specific Filipino jokes. Mm -hmm. So that's my fault, right? But Are you I in did, Vegas at this point? I was in, I was in uh, Vegas, yes. I was in mm -hmm. Vegas at that point. And I was just doing like very specific Filipino jokes. And it was like, oh, yeah, what am I doing? Like... I couldn't figure it out. It took me forever. So I would always revert back to like hacky Asian shit, you know what I mean? Or just sex jokes. And like, I couldn't find my identity. I couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it took years, Adam. Cause you know, it's like, how do you cater? It was like, how do you, what are my, what are my, uh, inspirations on TV? Like, what do I look at? It's like, you know, you watch uh, my Asian heroes on TV and it's just like, Oh, he's playing a Mexican guy. It's like, I didn't have anyone using my voice, the voice I'm familiar with on TV or actually just being a Filipino and just being anything on TV. Yeah. It was a different time. No, not, not represented. Maybe some extra work in mash. Yeah. But that's about all <laughs> that's I got. About it, which is still racist. Cause that was Viet. Well, no, that was Korea. Eh, we don't really sweat yeah, this you kind don't of care. details. You don't care. Remember that kid on the escalator? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that yeah, was yeah. Yeah. That was you. <laughs> Could have been me except for the hair. Yeah. And, but it's also, you're talking about finding your voice, yeah. you know, and, and then you kind of fall back on the easy stuff. Yeah. And it's easy to fall back on the easy stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, comedians, like how many times have you thought to yourself, like you go, I'm going to go do a set tonight at the comedy store or at the improv. And, and at 10 in the morning, you're like, I'm going to try a bunch of new shit. Yeah. And then at one in the afternoon, you're like, I'm going to do some new shit. Yeah. <laughs> and then like you're driving to the club and you're yeah. like, I'll do mostly old shit. Yeah. Cause you don't take, now I'm, I'm different than the you. Time. Well, I'm saying I'm speaking for most comedians oh. They and, and myself to some degree, which is you go, I'm going to fucking do a bunch of new shit. Yeah. And then the closer you get to walking on stage, you go, I'll do the shit I'm really familiar with that yeah. works that I know works. And you don't tend to grow as much. No, no, but no. It's, it's a lot I, easier. But And that's where a lot of comics make mistakes because I, I will not do that. I, I, I've never have. I just won't, Adam. Well, that's like, why you can you're come with Joy me. Joy. Yeah, that's why I'm Joy Joy. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I really do. And it, it's like, I'm but so- But did you used to do it back in the day? No, I always went up like that. Well, if I was doing Laugh Factory sets and I was working at Nordstrom Rack, of course I was, I was pounding out my sets. You know what I mean? Right. But now it's like, I'm not going to do my, my stuff that I'm doing at an arena when I'm at the Laugh Factory. That's right. a waste of time. I, yeah. I was just there two days ago, and and I my son came with me, and literally I looked at him. I go, I'm going to literally wing this from the top. I have a couple ideas I want to work on, and that's it. But and that's what I do. And so there is there is this weird thing, and 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 it, and it it sounds like it's up in the ether. This sort of finding your voice, mm -hmm. but it's really important. I don't know if some comedians ever really do, or maybe we haven't heard of them because no. they never found their voice, but no. there is this thing where you start to catch on to your voice, yeah. you know, and it can take a decade. It, 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 yeah, it does take a decade. I remember when someone said that to me for the first time, they were like, oh, it's going to take about 10 or 12 years. And I was just like, you oh, know, this guy's hating on me. He just doesn't want me to succeed. <laughs> he just doesn't want to tell me I'm funny. I used to think like that. And then right around year 12, I was like, oh, I get it. I, I'm finally just talking like me. And I'm comfortable with me instead of like playing to the room or just 
w- doing what I can do to make a get a, a laugh. Like I, I got it. So you're in Vegas. You start your stand up right out of high school. Yeah. You have civilian jobs to support yourself at yeah. some point. I'm yep. guessing. Uh, when do you quit the day job and go full time with comedy? That took a while. It, 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 I was renting out theaters. I was getting sponsors to pay for for these venues. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was bringing in amazing comics that no one heard of because when you play Vegas, you had to be a headliner mm-hmm. at, at that time. Uh, even in the comedy clubs, you had to be an, an established name. So they were doing open mic nights and stuff. So there were comics calling me. And at that point, my, my in at that point was getting into black rooms. I was so influenced by black comedy, mm-hmm. Def Jam and Showtime at the Apollo and BET's Comic View, that every time I found out that they were coming, I would try my hardest to get on that show. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly how I got on them. I got on all three with a bullshit resume and lying. And that's how I got on them. So I got BET's Comic View when a uh, Comic View when uh, my coworker goes BET's Com- BET's Comic View is at at this one venue, and I literally went home, put on a suit, got a fake resume, went to the front of the line, and said, "Hey, I'm a local comic. Uh, a lot of people know who I am here. Can I talk to the promoter?" And they, this guy, I remember the security guard went and got the promoter and. And she was like, our, our roster's full, but if you want to come and watch the show and I'll keep your resume and next time we come back, I'll, I'll bring you in. Swear to God, Adam, I walk in. I can't believe this even happened. Like she walked me in, she sat me next to like her booth where she was sitting and all the comics were late. <laughs> you know, put, put the joke where you want to, but <laughs> Black Show, all the comics were late. All of them, like 45 minutes late. Sold out night, they're all screaming like start to like they're mad and she walks right up to me. She goes, you want to go up? And at that time she had this XLR, it's a Canon XLR. And I remember that camera cause I wanted one. It was $5,000 for that camera. And I pointed at it. I go, if you can record my set with that camera right there, I'll go up. And she goes, give me two seconds to set up. And she set it up and I got a standing ovation that night. Wow. And I still have that videotape of it. Like you can see people standing in the front row. And, uh, and when I walked off stage, there was a comic named Bo P and her, Yvette Anderson, and Bo P was like, he was a regular on BET's Confview, and he was the host that night, and and he was like, what's your name? Joe Coy, he was like, man, you ever been on BET's Comic View? I go, nope. He goes, you on now. Wow. And a week later, I was on BET's Comic View, and that's how I got that. Well, I have uh, questions. Yeah. I have to take a break. I'll tease this one, <laughs> which is... Uh, Coming from where you come from, you have a high degree of personal momentum, chutzpah, yeah. I think uh, the Jews would call it, and confidence. And I just want to explore where that came from, because oftentimes when you come from your kind of family, it's hard. That stuff's in short supply. But we'll take a quick break. Be right back with Joe Coy right after this. All right, so the personal momentum. I, I find it fascinating. I, I'm, I come from a very downtrodden group, and my family was, you know, they had what they had personality-wise was like head lice. They had it. They gave it to everyone in the house. Yeah. You know what I mean? My dad was a bummer. My mom was a bummer. No one ever listened to a thing I said. And I just walked out of the house when I was 18, and someone handed me a shovel, and I just went, I guess this is my lot in life. <laughs> yeah. I, and I was funny. I was just so beaten down by my family system that I was like, this is what you got to do now. You got to go to work. But you have always had this sort of confidence. And I don't, I don't mean that in a braggadocious way. You knew who you were. These stories you tell are stories of confidence. How was that instilled in you coming from the sort of chaos and poverty that you come from? I, you know, indirectly, I think it was from my mom. Like, like I said earlier, like there was no Instagram, there was no Facebook. And when my mom came to this country, she was by herself and seeing my mom like walk up to people. Like I remember going to church and my mom would literally be scouting the room, trying to find someone that looked Filipino Mm -hmm. and making an effort at the end of the, you know, at the end, walking up to these people, finding out they're Filipino and, and then slowly building this community of friends to the point where uh, 
there's a thing called Knights of Columbus Hall, Mm -hmm. which is attached to a lot of churches. They would rent it out and do like these Filipino gatherings and then make me perform, my sister perform. And all these families would bring food so we can all try Filipino food, different foods. And it would just be like this party, this gathering. You know, because there were no Filipino restaurants back then. It was just like, it was so cool. And, I, and I'd see my mom, like, like create, like, these events, you know. And I'm just seeing her, like, hustle and, like, rolling lumpia. My mom would roll egg rolls and sell them at her work. And it's just like yeah. 25 bucks a bag. And no. I'm just like, oh, uh, I get it. I think it was in no. my DNA. No, that's – it's interesting because my mom didn't do anything. <laughs> and – she was, you know, welfare and food stamps and like hang around. She was depressed. And so I got this message that you couldn't do anything. Like it was a lot of, you're going to try, it's not going to work. Then, you know, life's a bitch and then you die. And my yeah. dad, and my mom didn't do anything. So I sort of looked at him and went, eh, I guess you can't do anything. But you saw your mom, even though she didn't have the money, you start doing things constantly yeah. and you got it sort of imprinted upon you that you could meet people, gather people, go to the Knights of Columbus Hall, make the Oompa Loompas, <laughs> with the, whatever. Egg roll's not going to cut it. You got to do your own thing. Just say lumpia. Lumpia. Thank you. Lumpia. <laughs> lumpia. Oh, why are you, where is, where's the like R, a, where'd the R come from? <laughs> I am like a Guatemalan grandmother yelling for her granddaughter to come in. Lumpia. Lumpia. Dinner time. Yeah. So, but your mom did things. Yeah. And you saw her doing things. Yeah. And you went, I guess things can be done. Yeah. Which was, which or, was good. Or make it happen. Yes. You got to make it happen. Right. Which you've definitely taken to the, to the next level yes. in, in your life. And so you start to get some traction. You end up, now you're on BET, I guess. Yeah, BET. And then that's how I got on the Black College Comedy Tour. Wow. <laughs> I swear. I was working at the uh, Black College Comedy Tour and I'm opening for all these famous black comics. And they were famous only because they were on Def Jam or on BET's Comic View, but they mm-hmm. weren't on like regular TV. They didn't have TV shows. And now they're kind of like household names, but back then they weren't. You know what I mean? Lavelle Crawford, mm-hmm. some more, uh, JB Smooth. Mm-hmm. Like those people were nobodies. No mm-hmm. one knew who they were back then. They were famous black comics, but I was opening for them. I was the other. You know, so it's like when you go to these student, uh, go to these colleges, uh, they couldn't have all black people. It had to be diversity. I Mm -hmm. was diversity. So Mm -hmm. it was like, you know, two black comics. And then, oh, we need a white guy, Joe Coy. Oh, we need an Asian guy, Joe Coy. Right. We need a Latino guy, man, Joe Coy. And I was literally, that's how I got on this thing. And so I started meeting them. I met JB Smooth. I met Honest John. I met some more. I met all these people. Um, And I kept telling them, I got a show in... Uh, Vegas. I got my own room. So if you guys want to get a room in Vegas, I'll get you a hotel. You know, it, they loved it because mm-hmm. I was giving them like a, a couple, like a thousand bucks. And then you can do this room and just it's one night. And they were like, yeah. So I started becoming friends with all these guys. And then uh, one guy was Honest John, this this one white old comic, hippie comic. And and he was big on the black circuit. He was on Def Jam, mm-hmm. BET's Comic View. And he was like, hey man, you need to be on Def Jam. He goes, when I come out to Vegas, I'm going to um, tell Bob Sumner. Bob Sumner is the owner of Def Jam, Def mm-hmm. Comedy Jam. Russell Simmons and Bob Sumner. Mm-hmm. He goes, I'm going to tell Bob Sumner about you and you're going to be on on uh, Def Jam. And I'm like, all right. And he was a man of his word. He came there on Def Jam and he called me over. He goes, meet me backstage. I'll, I'll tell him you're coming. I go backstage. Bob Sumner walks up to me and he's like, hey, Honest John says you're funny. I'm like, yeah. He goes, all right, I'm going to put you on. I'll give you five minutes, but this is how you're going to go out there. He goes, we're going to, kind of open the curtains and you crawl through it. <laughs> We're not going to open the curtains and sh- reveal the Def Jam set because it was mm-hmm. a big, beautiful oh, Def right. Comedy Jam set. He was performing from the cor- uh, curtains and, uh, and and it's before the show starts. We're, we're at half full, right? We're at 50%. So just go out there, do your five minutes, say good night. Don't say enjoy Def Jam. Don't say welcome to Def Jam. Just say I'm Joe Coy and say good night mm-hmm. and then come back there. And we're leaving the house lights. I swear to God, he said that we're leaving the house lights on because they're still ushering people in. And I remember when he left, I just looked at Honest John and my sister and her fiance at the time. And I was just like, I'm going to fail. Like, I might as well just leave. Mm-hmm. Like, why am I here? I was so pissed. And then, uh, and then the stage manager walked up to me and he was like, look, man, we're about 70% capacity. He goes, I'm going to bring those house lights down for you. 
that's the most I can do for you. Mm-hmm. He goes, but he felt so bad for me. Because people are still walking in. Yeah. He goes, but we're going to bring it down so it feels a little bit more intimate. I was like, dude, please, just anything will help. And I literally walked out there, and I got a standing ovation. And I know it sounds like I'm making this up, but I got a standing o. They went crazy. I said, I'm Joe Coy. Good do five, night. Five minutes? I think I, think I did seven tight. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was just blew up. Like mm-hmm. people screaming. Ah. I remember there was bleachers in the back and you hear them stomping. And then I crawled back through the curtain and there was Bob Sumner mm-hmm. eating like a muffin and Rudy Rush, who was, uh, you know, at the time he was the host of Showtime at the Apollo. Mm. His name is Rudy Rush. He took over for Steve Harvey. And, and I crawled through the curtain. My sister hugs me. She's crying. She's like, oh my God, that was so amazing. And Honest John was hugging me. He was like, killed it, man. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, Rudy Rush looked at Bob Sutter and goes, who the fuck is this guy? And he's like, oh, that's Joe Coy. That's Honest John's friend. He's like, why the fuck did you put him on at the beginning of the show, man? He's like, I got to go out there. Because right. why didn't you put him in the middle of the fucking show, Bob? And Bob was like, I didn't know he was going to be that funny shit. I said, well, that's fucked up, man. He said, that was a waste. And then he looked at me. He goes, you ever been on Showtime at the ball? I swear to God. You ever, been, you ever watch Showtime at the ball? I go, I love Showtime at the ball. He goes, we do a comedy section. I want you to be on it. I'm going to fly you out there. And Next thing you know, I'm on. Co- Not only did I get Def Comedy Jam, but like two weeks later, I'm doing Showtime with the Apollo. Wow! And I win that. Wow! Now, how old are you at this? Point? At that point, I'm at like that's like 1999. So that's like 20. What is that? 23 years ago. So I'm probably like 10 years in the game at that point. So you know, uh, so you're in your I don't know 28 or uh, yeah somewhere somewhere in that. Tw- we'll yeah. figure it out, but. So you know you have something. Oh, yeah. The question is... And I was no. doing all black rooms. I was opening for Snoop Dogg, Ludacris, all these people. I, was, I, like, I, I just had an in with like the black comedy circuit. Mm-hmm. Fat Tuesdays. I was doing Fat Tuesdays all the time. Is um, So for you, and, and you know, it doesn't get much bigger than selling out the forum multiple nights. I mean comedically that's that's that's, the, that's kind of it that's the mecca that's it but the question is 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 everything about success or is everything about progress i think just progress or just living in that moment like enjoying the moment and i and like i said earlier i'll, I'll be at the laugh factory i don't care I, I'm so happy that i'm doing stand up cuz this is my dream and i'm living a dream and anything else that that's happening more than stand up is just a bonus. Mm-hmm. It could be 15 people. It can be 15,000. I don't care. I'm just happy that I'm doing what I know I was born to do. Yeah, I, I concur. I mean, especially if you know what real work is. Yeah. I just feel like all the time I've done so much real work in my life that it just doesn't feel like work. You know, they, yeah. they go, you stay after and take pictures with people. I'm like, yeah, why not? Yeah. It's, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah. You shouldn't convert it into work. You yeah. Know? I don't understand people that do that too. I, I think what, I think the mistake that a lot of people have is they go, they go, okay, I started off working as a bartender or a waiter or a roofer and that was work. And, and everyone with those kinds of jobs would like to get paid the most and leave the earliest, you know, punch in at McDonald's used to work at McDonald's. It was work, you know, and then now your work is standing up on stage with a beer and crack and wise, but a lot of people convert it comedians into work. You know, now this is work. And I'm like, no, it's how you get paid, but don't really look at it as work. Like you used to look at your civilian jobs and they then bring that sort of civilian job mindset to the best job in the world. Yeah. And that's that's when it kicks in. That's when they want to haul ass out of the club second it's over. Yes. You know, or like, you know, you have those comedians where they go, look, we'll get you an opener in the middle and you only have to do 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes. And they'll go, how about 47 minutes? It's like, just do a fucking hour and 10 minutes or whatever, Yeah, whatever. Why? Yes. Why? You're on stage. It's air conditioned. Yeah. People are laughing. And where are you going where, other than the where? hotel room? You know how shitty that environment <laughs> yeah, is? Just beat off before you leave. Yeah. Man. <laughs> you want to be in such a hurry. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's my old thing. Where where are we going? There's yeah, nowhere to where go. Where are you going? So uh, you, the semen is still going to be there. 
Yeah. Yeah. I totally, I concur. Yeah. You don't have to, you can be, you can drop It'll that wait. load off later on. That's right. Yeah. It can wait. It can wait. <laughs> you know, that's why I don't like touching remote controls at hotel rooms. Oh, yeah. Because I know hands on that I've jerked off and grabbed that remote control when I was done. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, so I want everyone to hear that right now. When you go, <laughs> when you go check into a hotel and you touch that remote control, mm. chances are Joke there's a going. little bit of me on there. Oh, my God. I'm just being honest. I remember when I did that. I, I'm not even trying to make a joke right now. I remember doing that and then just changing the channel. Yeah. With my bare hand. And then thinking to myself, I'm not the only one. Yeah. No, people, it's like people smoking in a rental car. It's like, yeah. it's not my car. Yeah. I do what I want. Shit. Uh, speaking of beating off Chelsea Handler. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> had to get into that. <laughs> Unlikely pairing, but you guys seem to be thick as thieves, deeply in love. Oh, she's great. You know, and you know, the cool How'd thing you about- you guys meet? I met Chelsea right when I moved to L.A., Right when I moved to LA, and what what year? I moved to LA at like two thousand one ish, two thousand two, and then I met Chelsea like two thousand three, and at she the Laugh Factory, and she up. Yeah, she was doing, yeah, she was doing stand up. She wasn't who she was now, and we met with John Lovitz. I was opening mm-hmm. for John Lovitz on a Wednesday night. He had like the John Lovitz Wednesday night show, and one day he was like, "Hey, I'm going to bring Chelsea Handler." <laughs> She's gonna open for she's gonna open for us and she's hysterical. <laughs> she's my only friend on MySpace. Take a look. <laughs> that was awesome. Love it. And then I looked at it and it was literally Tom, right? It's Tom and and Chelsea Handler. Wow. And I was like, whoa. And then she started coming in and she was so funny. And we just hit it off right away. And 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 she we had like this chemistry there. And she was like, I I'm a, I'm in the process of making this show. And it was, the, you know, Chelsea lately. Mm-hmm. And um, she wanted me to be her sidekick. Mm-hmm. But at this point, you know, it's 2003. I'm still trying to get an hour special out. Mm-hmm. And at first I was like, yeah, because we did have good chemistry. And it sounded like a great show. And it was like, oh, a sidekick. And then we were doing all these meetings. And then right around like the third or fourth meeting, I called her. I was like, I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm going to pull out because mm-hmm. I still want to do me. I want to. I'm working on me. I want to be a comic. I want to be a stand-up comic. Is there a romance? Is there a No, there's none. There's nothing. Honestly, there's nothing. But there's chemistry. There's just chemistry. That's why she wanted me on it, because it was like our banter was so good. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I turned it down. She cursed me out on the phone. I'm still working at Nordstrom Rack at the time, and Borders Books, shelving books. And and it was the worst decision I ever made. No, it wasn't. At that time, it was. And she cursed me out. She goes, this show is going to be a hit. You made a fucking stupid mistake. Stop listening to your fucking people. Go with your heart, blah, blah, blah. You're in control of your own destiny. Blah, blah, blah. And hangs up the fucking phone on wow. me. And she was right. But she was passionate. She knew it was going to happen. And it did blow up. And I remember my ex-wife at the time. Well, she was my wife at the time. But she picked me up. She's like, there's this show I was watching before I picked you up. Do you know Chelsea Handler? And I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. It's like eight months later. And I'm like, yeah. And then. I, I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was working at Nordstrom Rack. And she never called me. But then about a year later, about six months later, she called me. And and it was history. Like I, I was on that panel every week. I have the most guests. Uh, I was the most guest appearances on that show. And, uh, and then the show ended. And then we kind of like went our separate ways. And then mm-hmm. I did my thing. And then we kind of, my book came out and I, I asked her to do a blurb for the book. Mm-hmm. And then that's how our friendship kind of came back together. And next thing you know, we were doing lunches and, and dinners. And then, and then all of a sudden she goes, kiss me. Wow. <laughs> yeah. She asked me. So second marriage in the cards. Oh, no, 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 mm-hmm. no, no, no. She's uh that's, ch- yeah, no, we're good. We're good. We're at, where we're at. And that's, that's the cool thing. Cause our friendship was purely based on, uh, before the fame and the money. Mm-hmm. So it's like, and, and now we both have that equally. Mm-hmm. So we both know that it's like, uh, I only want love from you. And she knows that I only want love from her. It's, there's no reason. I don't need her money. I don't need her fame. I, you know what I mean? We're, we're both in secure sp- spaces, you know? So that's what I love the most about this relationship. Um, you still living in the house up in the hill with the crazy old neighbor lady where you're going to buy her lot I bought or something? It. Oh, yeah, you did? She wasn't crazy. She was sweet. Oh. The, the I, other neighbor was crazy. Oh, maybe I was... Yeah. Maybe was, I was con- con- 
converted. No, no, one she was great. I loved her, but it was the other neighbor. You I can't bought stand. the house next to your house. Yeah, so I have that. To now. expand your house. Yeah, and now everything's you, gone. I knocked down every single one uh, of the house. Then let me tell I've talked about this before. I'm living with Chelsea right now. Are you guys out here in LA? Yeah, she's in Brentwood, but so I'm staying at her place, but she also bought a house, so she has a rental house. So you're doing like major construction? And so is she. The it's the number one. I've, I was talking about this on the show a few weeks ago. It's the number one power move you can do. Seth MacFarlane, when I used to see him back in his house in the hills, like back in the day, he he didn't want to move. But at a certain point, when you make fifty million dollars a year, you need to move from the house that you bought when you're making eight hundred thousand yeah. dollars a year. So they don't want to move, so they start buying all the land around them. Yeah. I just got back from Bill Maher's place. He pulled that same move. Kimmel did the neighbor move thing. It's it's you you've joined an elite fraternity <laughs> of successful gentlemen in Hollywood who've it, done that move. It's kind of cool, man, cuz I own the hill. It's I literally have the hill from front to back now. How's the CPAP machine it's going? It's beautiful, man. <laughs> it's beautiful. I see every color. When I wake up, everything is so vivid. It's everything's in 4K now. I remember seeing your CPAP machine in your bedroom and yep. thinking, I, "What I, a loser!" <laughs> no, <laughs> is this I, guy a fighter I pilot? I have a version of CPAP guys that I get watching cable TV, and it's yeah. a husky white guy in yeah. his sixties. You know, I just <laughs> yeah. didn't have uh, fit Asian in my lexicon yeah. <laughs> of CPAP users. Yeah, <laughs> but maybe it's close enough to K-pop or something <laughs> that you guys are attracted to it. I don't know. Are, Hey, sleep apnea, you good? Oh, I'm good. These things, just things, it's a rushing into my head. The yeah. backyard swimming pool, the fence that was going around there. <laughs> That's It's all, you it's should see it now. There's there. a basketball court there now. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, it's looking that really is, cool. That and is then you got to see my, my weight room now. I would love to. It's the same, like, I, I, you remember Ferris Bueller when he had that garage that looked out into the mountain? Yeah, the cantilevered over or, with the big glass facade. I, I have that. Wow. Yeah, it's it's cool. I uh, I am so tickled pink that you've had the kind of success you've had and all very organic. Thank you. And also the thing about this business because we all know the names of the people that were artificially hoisted to some height very quickly. Yeah. Sometimes it's just about a look or a vibe or an MTV or some some yeah. shit is just like in the 80s or the 90s or just the right hair or the zeitgeist or something. Yep. And you have more success than you've probably earned or that your talent would probably deserve. But that goes away because fashions change and trends change yeah. and the zeitgeist, the wind starts blowing the other direction. But if you build what you have built Brick by brick, you know, you've just poured a foundation, you know what I mean? And it wasn't, oh, he shot to stardom because of this overnight, whatever. If you build that base and you've built your base like so methodically and with so much preparation and so much repetition and so much like honest work and work ethic that every time I see you, you've just stacked another Lego on top of your success pyramid. Whereas other guys, it's like, oh yeah, they canceled my show. And it's like, boop, back down, yeah. you know, back down to here. So where, whereas there's no meteoric rise to the stars, it's this long game. But I feel, I feel like your base is so solid that every time I see you've just built on it. Thank you, man. Yeah. I, 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 I just don't understand when, you don't shake hands and kiss babies in this game. Like grassroots is the core to success, right? It's well, like well, what you're I think you're talking about relationships. Yeah. Like you have relationships. I really do. But you know that forum show was so special to me, Adam, when you walked out there. And one, you were such a big, sig significant part of my success. You know, I felt that I shared that stage with people that were like a part of that journey, you know? that indirectly helped me to get where I was. And and like just seeing you go up there and, and Tiffany, me and Tiffany has, we have so much history together, you know? Like we, yeah. Yeah, and, and just like, you know, when when I went out that night, it, it didn't feel like I was doing a show for people that uh, 
were just fans. I felt like everyone in that audience was was like, we're here, Joe. Yeah. Like, we're here. Not Joe Coy. Like, we we all made it to the forum, Joe. Finally, yeah. we're here. This is our moment. That's what it felt like. Yes. I felt like I was sharing that moment with just like everyone that wanted to have a reason to be in the forum and celebrate. And that was the reason. Yeah, it it, it felt that way. You felt it, that, it felt right? Like they were like pulling for you. Yeah, it was so cra- it was so emotional. Even my son said when they turned on the house lights, he said he started getting choked up and he started tearing up because he felt it too. Mm-hmm. It was there was something there it was that moment. It was it was kind of like living in this country for so long and just like we we just want that vote our voice. We want to be heard. And that was the night where they're like, you're going to hear us tonight. Yeah. And that's it what was, it felt like. It was uh, magical, it I would was. say. But it's it's also in a in a world where you're not always pulling for everybody. Um, I've always, you know, always pulled for Joe Coy. And so I, I love I love the fact that every time I see you, you're more successful than the last time I see you. <laughs> But your attitude is just as humble, just as gracious, hugging everybody uh, here under this roof and such a sweet and humble guy that uh, I'm just, I'm proud to say, to call you a friend. Oh, I love you, man. Love you, man. All right. Let me give you a plug. I know uh, know we got... uh, You know, I got two more things to plug, right? We got you got the world tour. You got funny is funny. But you know that that second special I shot for Netflix. That's the one uh, Steven Spielberg watched. It, was that coming in hot or was that coming the third? in hot? Coming in hot. He oh. watched coming in hot when he was shooting West Side Story. <laughs> Swear to God, this is the story. And, and and he brought me in for a general meeting. Wow. And uh, everyone was like, "Steven's a huge fan." I was like, "Are you talking about Steven from accounting? Like, who right. are you talking about? Which Steven are we talking about?" We're at Amblin. I thought it was a general. And we sit down, it's Holly and Jeb from, you know, the, the execs there. And like, Steven's such a huge fan. Pitch us a movie. Wow. And I pitched him this movie, and eight months later, we're shooting it. And this the this movie right here, you know, is it's about a Filipino family. But most importantly, what I said to him, I go, it's an American family. And wow. you've seen this family. Yeah, they're Filipino, but you're going to relate to them because they're Americans. And they're doing everything that your mom does. You're, they're doing everything that your son does and your aunt does. It's it's the same thing. And that's what the, I wanted this show to be, this movie to be. And I, it comes out August. Steven Spielberg's a big fan. I know I said I was pulling for you 10 minutes ago, but now I'm pissed. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ, Joe. Could you give the fucking career brand for the fucking rest of us? <laughs> God damn. I was rapping this shit, yeah. and you had to jump in with your fucking Steven Spielberg's a huge fan. Yeah. I got nothing, man. Yeah, you do. You got We got each other. <laughs> so that's coming out in August? August. Can, can we go to the premiere? I want you there so bad, Adam. I will be there with fucking bells on. Yes. It's, it's called Easter Sunday. We should yep. we should say what it's called. Easter oh, Sunday. Yeah. Oh, Jay. Uh, Shanda. Shanda oh, you right. love Jay Shanda I, lo- I love that guy. Gray's a good director. Uh, Jimmy O. Yang, we love him. Tiffany, Tiffany Haddish. Haddish. Tia Carrera, we love her too. Lou Diamond, yeah. I, I enjoy those guys as well. So that's going to, I'll tell you what you just, go to Joe Coy, J-O-K-O-Y.com for all the dates and all the stuff he puts up there. Can we you didn't even, fucking one time say my name right? Joy Coy. God <laughs> damn it. Joy. All right, brother. I Great, love you. Gene. Uh, I'm going to be in... No, uh, say you love me first. Oh, sorry. I love you. I love you too, Adam. I'm going to be in Waukegan, uh, Illinois, at the Genesee Theater tonight, as you hear this. Maybe a few tickets left, then you can go to AdamCarolla.com for all the live shows. Until next time, Adam Carolla for Vinny Tortorich, yeah, and Gina Grant and Paul Bryan and Joe Coy. Yes. Say it. Mahalo. Because I was like, well, where am I going to go? And you're already pot committed at yeah. this point. Yeah, I mean, we already hired the director and, and, and the producer. and you know, the, I just paid like $12,500 for these stupid letters behind me. Right. Like, like, like no one knows that. Like, when, that, when they say cut, they just break it and throw it in the trash.